I'd like to call the meeting to order. Would everyone uh, please stand and join us for the flag salute? Welcome everyone. Thanks for breaking away from a nice summer evening uh, to join us. Um, I'd like to, we'll start out with the approval of the minutes from our last meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And uh, item number three is the approval of the agenda and consent agenda. I move we approve tonight's agenda and consent agenda. <coughs> I second. Roll call. Alicia? Aye. Andy? Aye. Terry? Aye. And I'm aye. Okay. Um, we will move on to item D, public interest reports, presentations, action. And item two, uh, D2, is um, a res um, will be a motion to rescind the June 28th uh, decision um, in regard to transitional kindergarten. I move that we rescind our June 28th motion that included restricting transitional kindergarten to children qualifying under our current board policy. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, item three is a discussion and. Uh, Okay. Oh, okay. So let's read the whole thing then. Let's, we'll, we'll, we'll do a do-over. Can we get a okay. do-over? <laughs> you want me to read? Yeah, go ahead and read okay. that. Um, at the June 28th, 2016 regular meeting, the board approved a motion to maintain the current board policy that limits transitional kindergarten children whose fifth birthdays occur between September 2nd and December 2nd. Due to the fact that this action was not included among the listed options for consideration, it is recommended that the board rescind the action so that the item may be considered against, again pursuant to the next agenda item. The earlier motion also included limitations on intra-district transfers, which will also be further considered and acted upon within the next item. So as an uh, amendment to the motion, uh, I move that the board rescind its June 28th motion that included restricting transitional kindergarten to children qualifying under current board policy, which also includes intra-district transfers. A second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Craig. Um, We'll move on to item three, uh, which is a, a discussion and uh, potential action regarding expanding the, the transitional kindergarten for children with fifth birthdays occurring after December 2nd. Uh, we'll discuss issues and budget considerations, staffing, possible options, board policy considerations, and intra-district transfers. Good evening and thank you, trustees and um, community members for the opportunity to take a step to the side for a moment and uh, present you with some basic preliminary information. Some of it is going to be redundant for some because um, those of us working in a day-to-day -day, um, understand it and, and we're hands-on and for the benefit of the community, I thought it would be important to just um, provide some basic facts and information so that we can then move forward with your discussion this evening. The transitional kindergarten class is intended for students who turn five between September 2nd and December 2nd. And this is a result of the Kindergarten Readiness Act of 2010, which went into full implementation in the 14-15 school year. As you all will remember, there was a phase-in process. 
It is the first year of a two-year kindergarten program designed to prepare students and help them, give them an advantage in their uh, future success of their schooling uh, from kindergarten through graduation. It, of course, uh, gives young learners the gift of time, and that was the intention of the Simonton Bill, uh, to provide students with an, a stimulating environment which really focused on their physical, social, emotional development, and intellectual development, providing them with a strong educational foundation for the traditional kindergarten class. It is taught by a credentialed teacher, and it is does require implementation of a very specific curriculum with a developmental focus. And recently clarified education policy, as noted here, an amendment to the California Ed Code 48,000 Part C, permit districts to expand their traditional kindergarten programs to enroll four-year roles at the start of the school year if they turn five years old after the December cutoff. And that is a local option. The language expanded that opportunity. Specifically, Assembly Bill 104 amended the California Ed Code to subsection B of the Ed Code 48,000 C, number three. Districts can choose to expand their transitional kindergarten programs to enroll four-year-olds who turn five during the same year. So in our current status, that would be December 3rd, 2016, and June 30th, 2017, specific to the school year ahead of us. And it is at the discretion of the school district to do so. There are two caveats and two important note here to mention that it must be in the best interest of the child when doing so. And the parents have to have informed consent, which means that they have been properly informed with the advantages and disadvantages of that early admission. With respect to early admission for underage children to kindergarten, uh, districts and CDE staff are often asked about enrolling children who are not age eligible for the transitional kindergarten, kindergarten or even first grade. And the California Department of Education has no authority over the districts. They do not have authority to require and this is strictly a local decision. While Education Code 48,000B allows a child to be admitted early on a case-by-case -case basis, districts offering this option to families would be wise to have the local governing board adopted criteria by which the students are accepted. Some districts base their decision on of the early admittance simply based on date of birth. So for example, if December 3rd, is a birthday or December 11th and December 14th and then January 10th and so on and so forth. It would be based on the chronological birth order, test results, maturity of the child, pure, uh, preschool records, for example, may also be considered. It is a local control decision how this is accomplished, whether it is in writing and whether there is an appeals process. If these children continue into kindergarten, past the anniversary dates, then we must have an informed contin kindergarten continuance form on file in order to be able to continue the children. It's almost like a permissive retention and it does require informed consent by the parent in order to jeopardize audit findings and result in loss of apportionment. Now, for us, we're basic aid and so the apportionment piece is an, not applicable. However, this is required for auditing purposes. Furthermore, Education Code Sections 46110 through 46119 detail the minimum and maximum lengths of the school day for kindergarten and other elementary grade classrooms. And so, the minimum for kindergarten is four hours, excluding recess. However, recess time can be counted if a certificated teacher is supervising the students and the students are under the discretion of the credential teacher at that time. If we were to operate any TK programs less than the kindergarten program length of school day, it would require a waiver to be submitted to the State Board of Education. So that's very basic background information to ensure 
that we're all operating with the same information. And the reason I bring this forward is because we have all, and I in particular, have been asked a lot of questions. Uh, there have been some myths or some misunderstandings about early TK being a new program that districts are required to implement versus TK and meaning early or expanded transitional kindergarten program after the December 2nd birthday. So the E or the expanded, the early, the enhanced TK is not a new program. Rather, the Ed Code was amended to allow districts to admit the students after the December 2nd cutoff. Pertinent to our local administrative regulation, our administrative regulation 5111 uh, is very clear. Um, as I mentioned before, it does show the phase in process and the full implementation as of the 14 15 school year to admit the students whose fifth or sixth birthday falls on or before those dates, according to the Ed Code, and that any child who will have his fifth birthday between the date listed above shall be offered a transitional kindergarten program. And so shall means must. And so I think for the basis of this moment in time, we are fully implementing the transitional kindergarten program based on the Ed Code and the shall, which means that we will, it is required, must to serve children whose birthdays are between September 2nd and December 2nd. Furthermore, Administrative Regulation 5111 for Transitional Kindergarten goes on to say that on a case-by-case -case basis, a child who reaches age five after the date listed above, and that was on the other slide, September 2nd through the December 2nd, may be admitted to kindergarten at any time during the school year with the approval of the child's parent guardian, provided that, one, the superintendent or designee determines that the admittance is in the best interest of the child, two, the parent guardian is given information regarding the advantages and disadvantages and any other explanatory information about the effect of early admittance, and three, the superintendent or designee may also consider availability of classroom space and any other negotiated maximum class size, which refers to our bargaining bilateral agreement. And then, Trailer Bill, Assembly Bill 104, Section 20, which amended the Education Code 48,000, Letter C. This was the place where we were, where we then discovered that our board policy. Well, I, I just, I'd like yes. to make one point of clarification. Certainly. There. So <clears throat> in reference to, to our administrative regulation 5111, uh, uh, which is, is, is revolves around transitional kindergarten. There's an underlying um, code 6170.1, and in that in that board policy, um, there there's there's a uh, paragraph two paragraphs that have to do with eligibility that are that are pertinent to our board policy. And uh, so I think just for, uh, I know you're trying to clarify here, but yes. but I think this that last um, slide tend, would tend to confuse the audience because our, just to be clear, our board policy currently as it stands in regard to eligibility, and I'll read it, the district's transitional kindergarten program shall admit children whose fifth birthday lies between September 2nd and December 2nd for the 2013-14 school year and each school year thereafter. Parents and guardians of eligible children shall be notified of the availability of this program and, and the age, residency, and any, any other enrollment requirements. Enrollment in the transitional kindergarten program shall be voluntary. Parents may appeal the enrollment dates based on their child's individual educational needs. The appeal may be submitted to the superintendent for review by the transitional kinder, kindergarten committee. So that's, I think that's an important part of, of that, your explanation. Look, thank you.
The Trailer Bill Assembly 104 Section 20 amended the Education Code 48,000C, which then changed the language from the superintendent or designee to the requirements of the governing board to make a determination that the admittance is in the best interest of the child. And so then at that point, if the governing board so wishes, the superintendent or designee makes the recommendation regarding whether a child should be granted early entry into kindergarten. And in doing so, the superintendent or designee shall consider various factors, including availability of space and any other negotiated maximum class size. And not unusual in the Carpinteria Unified School District, we did indeed have parents who contacted me or the school principals to inquire about the likelihood of their child entering early into the program because of their age becoming five in that school year, but after the December 2nd birthday. And so we did so with the utmost confidence and willingness to work with our families. We did so for instructional purposes. Um, we are educators, we are teachers, and so we did that and met with families and there were principals and teachers at school sites who worked with the families and in some cases denied the readiness based on some assessments and conversations with the parents. And then we had the number of students that we presented to you at the last board meeting, which ended up necessitating the conversation of adding, expanding, or including one full-time equivalent. Shalene, how many were yes. denied? Oh my goodness, I, I don't have that, but um, I know that Jamie Persoon is here. If you would like, perhaps she could respond to that question. Uh, I think at Canalino we probably I, I, we didn't keep track like we did with the ones that were accepted about four to my recollection. And what was the, the basis of their? Denial? They uh, the process was to meet with me first, and then they were referred to um, Melody Aguila, who's our TK teacher. And in some cases, that meeting took place with the preschool teacher as well. In a lot of our situations, it was on site because we have the CCP teacher on site. And, was and then if the parent and you know after discussing what the TK program entailed the parent and the teacher decided it was best to stay in preschool or if the child seemed ready for transitional was kindergarten. Was there a formal observation or no, assessment No, we didn't have a protocol used? for an assessment. We talked about it many times but um, we the had protocol. some suggestions but there was no formal was protocol really or assessment. A discussion? Mm-hmm. Okay. At all? Yeah, That's oh, and the, the process, by the way, was the same. Holly and I were um, collaborating on how we would go about this as well as um, Mary Lewandowski and Melody, who were both the TK teachers that were meeting with families. Um, before you sit down, yes, Jamie, when did these discussions with families first start taking place? We started getting inquiries in the fall of last year. Um, and so we started doing discussions and meetings probably around January. Uh, official kindergarten registration, I believe, was February 22nd, um, started this year, but we began to have the inquiries far before that. Um, and I think we communicated with families by letter sometime in March. Thank you. So was, I'm sorry, um, since you're here, was there any consideration that, that those four children that were denied could mature in the next eight months before? You know, I wasn't part of those started? meetings that went from Micheline to me to Melody and the parent and the preschool teacher. But I, my understanding was that the, the, the parties came to a mutual agreement that this was not a program appropriate for the child, but far more children were accepted than were not. Okay. And then parents began to um, enroll or begin an enrollment process online. And one of the things that we wanted to provide to you, because there were some questions about, well, what exactly did the ARIES portal automated response say? Um, and so you have that there in your PowerPoint. And I'll just read this for the benefit of um, folks that may be watching. 
the Aries Portal account was created. Dear Miss Miglis, this email is to inform you that an Aries Net parent account has been created. Using this email address, this account will allow you to view student information about Miglis Jr. <laughs> you will also be able to register your student for school next year and update other information such as emergency contacts, etc. And there was a URL link there and a username and a password for utilization. I'm gonna, okay, sorry, yes, I'm certainly. Gonna, so w did any families complete this process? And M Mari, Mari um, has indicated that beyond this, they did not go further. Is that correct, Mari? So this happened, but not the rest of the steps, according to staff. Okay, okay. I'm sure we'll hear from some parents. Well, and I'm going to want to hear from um, our attorney. So we have time to do that still. But. Great. And now um, what I shared in front of you um, earlier before the meeting started was um, a list. And I want to just review the list that you have in front of you so folks know that we are looking at a roster. It is confidential in that there are no student names. However, we sorted the children uh, by their birth date. And what you have in front of you is a combined list of students from CCP. And Maria extends apologies. She is officially on vacation, although she was very involved in our in-house planning meetings for this presentation. Um, so she was right there the entire time. In fact, um, she once again um, overdid her work and sent to Jolene and I three separate emails of potential contingency plans being prepared, um, which we know her to be, and very thorough, uh, pending the outcome of this meeting. So I just want to make mention that she did work really hard to help us and to be part of this, even though she's not here tonight. So the list that you have in front of you, one page, shows list by date of birth and the date of birth that is identified in an italic font are the students that are currently enrolled at CCP and those that is not in italic font are the students that are in our purview. The reason I bring this forward is to show you that if, and we don't know this, a student would deselect the CCP program to come to us, that then if we sorted the students by date of birth, this is what our roster would look like. But we have no way of knowing. <clears throat> now, Maria did extend and contact to the best of her ability, and she asked Jamie as well for contact information. Um, some folks' numbers have changed, and we didn't have current information. And some of these students actually told Maria, at least verbally, that they intend to stay at CCP. The issue is this is the best information that we have available at this time. Okay. So with that in mind, I'd like to ask our CBO, Maureen Fitzgerald. Could I, oh, certainly. I have a question on this yes. list. I see you have school of residence, but there's a number of um, children that don't have a school of residence. Why is that? Um, well, that was uh, information. Those are probably all the students from the CCP, and that just was not provided to us. Those are the italics. So we don't know where these children live, whether they're that is correct. district students or not? Correct. Well, they're district students. We, we just, just don't, don't know, know their school of which school of residence. They all live here in Carpentier. Yes. Okay. Now, the question about the intra and the reason why we needed to include that was because there are schools requested here, as you can see, and so that's part of that conversation is that, for example, um, while we have a student, and this is date of birth, if you will, join me on January 30th, 2012, um, School of Residence Aliso requesting Canalino. Which we would not necessarily need to approve if we were to be at that point. Okay. So we have students with birthdays ranging from December 6th, 2011, all the way through June 8th, 2012. 
And some of those students say, for example, um, perhaps an educator might look at this list and say, well, the students whose birthdays are as of, for example, February 12th or March 1st, they're very young and they're going to get picked up the next year in the transitional kindergarten program. Yes, Michelle? I think all of them would just go straight to K, right? It all goes straight to K. No, t no TK. No TK. Right. Mm. Right? Correct. Because they'll all be five. Yes. So, yeah, the following year. And some of the districts um, that I've been communicating with and we've been comparing notes, um, when we'll talk about some options in just a little bit. Um, um, Maureen's going to come up and join me because together we want to talk to you about the next slide, which then leads to, okay, so what are some of the options uh, that you might consider? So Maureen. So one of the options, of course, <coughs> status quo is an option for everything all the time, and so we listed that here. Um, option one, oh, I'm sorry, let's, let's begin with the current numbers, and what you have in front of you is the breakdown of the roster. Um, current new students, those that would qualify from CCP, and the opportunity to fill open seats that are currently available. So at the time that we did this, um, we had 29 that were enrolled for the um, extended TK or the, the, the expanded, key, whatever we're going to call it. And we also identified uh, 19 more kids that would be eligible that we knew of from CCP. <coughs> Um, there were a, a few additional maybe than the 19, but we did, Maria did identify some that were already known to be going into Head Start or another program that probably would not have come into the TK program. We, at the time, looked at how many enrolled, are currently enrolled in the two TK programs at Canalino and Aliso, and so we had some capacity there. So what we're really looking to do is figure out the delta between the 48 and the 18 and how to get them placed. What are the options for those? Um, so we have our first option, which is our status quo, and it's not offering an additional TK expansion at all. Um, our second option is that we only fill the existing slots by date of birth, and that again is not expanding any additional staffing. Um, so it's a zero cost delta here. <clears throat> and then option three, is that we take a look at an, um, an option of enrolling those post-December 2nd birthdays at the semester and offering a half-year program at the semester. So that would basically be about a $43,000, $44,000 cost for a full-time teacher half of a year. Another option was to add a TK classroom um, and fill it by date of birth and the cost of that classroom would be just about $97,000 with furniture and materials. Um, we averaged a teacher salary um, not, not at the low end, not at the high end, kind of maybe below the mid-range end knowing we aren't probably going to get somebody that's brand new green or we might have a <clears throat> an opportunity to, to save a little bit if somebody does come in brand new green. And then the last option we explored was what if we didn't, Carpentria did not expand their program, we did not add a classroom, but we contracted with CCP to fill a spot for these kids. So the cost of that was going to be um, two five-hour-a-day teachers because as a, then they'd become preschool the student ratio is 1 to 12, so it is a different ratio. They have to have two, two teachers for those classrooms. The cost would be about 87 and then furniture and materials. So it's not that much different than adding our own in-house. 
So those were the options that, that through a lot of process that we came up with to be able to provide for the board. We want to provide time for discussion at this moment. Um, some considerations for clarification, options, recommendations, and um, you know, ask how staff can um, implement um, your your will based on our recommendation. I'd I'd like to hear public comment first. Certainly. We discussion. All right. Uh, the first speaker is Maureen Claffey. Hello, thank you. Um, I want to just say, first of all, that I'm here on behalf of about four other families um, and my husband as well. Um, he's home with our sick child and and the rest of the families couldn't make it because of their other obligations. So imagine me with five other, four other adults around me. Um, I didn't prepare any comments formally today because I've written so many letters and sent so many emails and text messages. I feel like my position is pretty clear. I want to thank you for acknowledging the Brown Act violation and rescinding the previous act. I think that's really important. It, it, it kind of rebuilds some trust there. I think the only thing left to do now is to, is to bring these children into the classroom. 28 families. It's not a lot to ask. You're repaving roads. You've got Measure U money. You've got rainy day funds. All that's lacking is the will. And um, speaking of vows, today is my eighth wedding anniversary. I would much rather be out to dinner. But I'm here because I have a commitment to my daughter, which is stronger than any commitment I have to anyone or anything. And that commitment says, I will do my best for her. And I, if I promise her something, I'm going to do my best not to take that promise away. And we were promised TK to her. And I don't care about the blame. At this point, we could point our fingers every which way. I want action. I want leadership. And I think my daughter and these 28 families deserve to have their children be given the promised education that they asked for. Thank you. The next speaker is Leah Boyd. Hi, everybody. Thanks for, um, thanks for putting this on the agenda. Thanks for hearing us again. I won't go back over all the comments I had last time. Um, I mostly want to thank you for, for having us. And I want you to consider these 28 kids who could be leaders in their kindergarten classrooms would then be leaders throughout their entire school careers and how much positive effect that will have um, on the school district. Um, <clears throat> I, I do have a question. I'm confused by the $87,000 salary for a TK teacher. Um, I obviously need to get into teaching if that's <laughs> the going rate. That, 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 that includes benefits. all the benefits. Oh. You know, there's, there's about I still need to go into teaching then. And there's all, wow. the, all the stirs and the purrs. <laughs> would gladly take you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, well, that was my only question. Thank you so much. And the last speaker is Alyssa Gonzalez. So not going to go over everything I went over last time. Um, a quick note, though, that our family, we actually came into the school office and were told to enroll our son in the TK program and that it was extended. So I think that's most wholeheartedly myself. I had been holding a spot with him for his other care spot, and I lost that on account that I was told enroll him. And it was a confident enroll him a week before you guys made that decision. So for me, it's what what happened um so i think that's our, our our family's main concern is the being able to trust in the honesty of that thank you
one more speaker. Christy Let's Boyd. Stay right here then. Um, I want to thank you for opening this up again. I've had discussions uh, with my daughter, Leah Boyd, about this. And I have not been that involved until now. But I, I, I'm coming in from a more objective standpoint. And I do feel like, uh, I feel like this community really stepped up with Measure U. And I feel like they said, education is important to our community. And we are willing to to do a $90 million bond, and having been on some fundraisers, I know that's a lot of money. And it feels to me, and I've heard this echoed from other people, that if the community is saying that to you and now giving you the funds for new computers, new roofs, and that kind of thing, that your budget should be able to include important programs like the TK program. You have signs saying thrive, uh, cradle to career. I think that in order to back that up, you need to provide programs that are really giving children the ability to become part of this district. I know there's a lot of flight from this district. I feel that the Spanish immersion class was denied. Now this tea cake thing is up in the air and I I feel that there's a lot of young families here that are f are feeling that there's not a lot of give with the board and that they're not being proactive enough and and could then further this flight from public schools. And it's important that you get a real broad base of students here and parents that obviously care very much they're here in the middle of summer to advocate for this program I I did work for CUSD for years in a program called the PIP program which a pri which was a primary intervention program it was a great program and one of the tenets of that program was that students really need to feel good about their very early education and the school that they're part of and I think by getting these 28 families or more involved in this school district at this young age, you're creating that sense of, of importance of education for these families. The PIP program kind of foundered as, as grants do, but it, it really made me realize how important these early years are. And I think this TK program can really help foster that importance of education, not only for the children, but also for these families. These are young, struggling families that really want to be part of a public education. And I think it's important that you listen to what they're saying. Thank you. Is that it, Julian? All right. Okay. Um, I, w I would just, I wasn't here at the last meeting. I didn't get to hear what you all had to say, but I, I did, was a lot of what you what you conveyed to the board was very, um, was was then uh, relayed to me. And I and I just want to thank you all for for your uh, involvement and, um, and your uh, dedication to your children. Um, I, I think that uh, I also want to apologize for the angst that, that this whole issue has caused everyone. You know, it it, it was, I believe, completely preventable. Um, and and from from my standpoint, I think, regardless of what what legal rights we have or what legal position we have, our moral obligation is is to um, allow those those families that we. Have, have been in contact with to enroll um, and and that but in knowing that that's going to you know potentially open a can of worms and and that you know our our primary directive as a, as, as a board is is to watch the purse strings of a district and and as you all probably know we we are uh, we're we're uh, constantly battling with with our with how much money we have and where we're spending it and um, this is an unexpected expense, but I think it's it's our duty to you as a community, as and 
and I don't I, I don't think there's any doubt that all of us value early education I think I don't I mean there's not a question about that it's just a matter of of essentially what we're faced with here is not just 28 students it's potentially you know an entire um, additional class of students minus the 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 current uh, TK enrollees which which is um, you know, it potentially is a very big number, and it could potentially amount to not just one one position; it could be three positions. And and that, as you can see, that's a very big big number that we were unprepared for. And um, you know, as as to our decision in our early June meeting to to um, you know not move forward with the program. Unfortunately, that was the very first time we had heard that we were extending the early TK program. And, and, and that's why I want to apologize, because it should never have got to the point where, where, where families were told they were enrolled and uh, without us actually having the opportunity to, to, uh, to review the, the parameters, the eligibility, and the, and the costs associated with that. So it, it, it was a, a disservice to parents. It was a disservice to our staff because I know they've spent an awful lot of time, um, you know, that they could spend on a whole lot of other things. Um, and, and I, you know, it's taken away from you guys, and I'm sure it's caused a lot of heartburn throughout the summer that you certainly didn't need. So um, without, you know, I know there's, you guys have got some comments as well, but um, m my feeling is that, that we need to, um, we need to allow, uh, basically extend the early, uh, early child or early TK program it, it, for, for one year. I, I don't, I, I don't think we, I think we need to revisit it and, and, um, and then at, at some point between now and the end of, you know, December, we need to establish a certain, uh, protocol, some eligibility that, that we can apply for years moving forward. Um, but that's, you know, that's kind of where I, I'm standing on the issue. I don't know where everyone else is. You want to go or do you? No, you can go. Okay, so um, just to reiterate what Andy said, I mean, we sitting up here sincerely apologize that um, this happened. Um, like, um, you said it's it's beyond the finger pointing at this point and and we we want to do right by by you guys and so um, I'm in agreement that we need to figure out how we're going to serve um, the families this year and then and revisit I'm I'm very concerned that um, decisions were made without a protocol in place and so um, I I think in all fairness to those four families that were denied, I mean, that, that also has to be re-looked at. Um, I'm curious of um, what advantages and disadvantages were relayed to families about this. Um, it, again, as an early childhood person, um, you know, a, a, a year's difference between a four-year-old and a five-year-old is massive and in even in terms of months, the, the readiness and maturity level. And TK, um, as much as I'm a big supporter, is a different quality than an early childhood experience. You're going from one adult to 24 children alone from a 1 to 12 or even a 1 to 8, depending on where you know, you're coming from. And so a child who's not ready... Um, it can actually do more harm than good. And so, um, but again, that's a case by case basis, um, but without a protocol in place, it's hard to uh, really know <laughs> if, uh, if a teacher has observed a child for 30 minutes as compared to some formalized assessments. But off my soapbox, um, I agree with Andy, um, this year only we need to uh, look at honoring the promises made did you want to say something uh, yes I did um so just working locally in the community I know that your magic number of 28 is not 28 
And so um, my only concern is when um, Jamie, you were discussing how the interest was sparked, and that's how this whole ball got rolling from what I understand. So if we do go through with this, I would like it to be advertised as well as, you know, the Spanish dual immersion was. And to have, I know we have, we're working on a short time period here, but to have those students of the patients that I serve in Carpinteria have the same opportunity that these 28 students have to, to apply, to enroll, to have a policy as stated by that um, board policy that you have, Andy, it specifically cites a TK committee. And do we have that currently? I think you read something yeah. about a TK committee. And who is that committee comprised of? And what are they using for their evaluation tools? Because I believe that's very important. So when this 28 number ends up being 38, 48, I'm just for the sake of argument, we're going to have to include all those kids. And I agree with Michelle that those four kids, whether it was four kids that were you know, put by the wayside versus 14, we still need to include those kids for this year and figure out what we're going to do for next year. So when we talk about the $120,000 that it was going to take to pay for child care for the 28 families that aren't going to be able to um, enroll in our new extended TK, I think we need to include everybody. And and that's what, you know, where our concern is what Andy said, that we might be opening up a bigger situation here as far as space, as far as teachers, as far as classroom sizes. And um, I do agree that we did, that whatever the finger pointing, whatever um, got us here to this point, we can rectify that by agreeing with Andy and Michelle and going through with it for this year, but really doing it the right way and not having the cart before the horse as it was just in the past few weeks. I think we need to stand up proud as a community in Carpinteria with all the education that we have, with all the informed parents that we have to make this a system that works and not one that we need to backpedal on. And I think it's important to go forward with that and go forward with it the right way and policies in place and adhering to the policies that we have. And if the policies that we have don't accommodate our community, then as a community to rectify that and to um, maybe um, amend some of those. Um, I agree with the statements of my fellow board members and I, I would I would be agreeable to move forward with this program as a pilot program, a one-year pilot program, to be reevaluated. Uh, I am concerned that we don't have any criteria, and um, I'm a little concerned about what happens when others come forward, and I'm not quite sure. Um, Craig, could I ask you a question at the podium, please? So if we um, initiate this pilot program and have families come forward, um, is there a time frame by which they have to do that? Can we designate a time frame? Or if they come forward throughout the year, do we have to consider, just as we would with a student that comes to enroll in our schools? I think at this point you have the option to impose a reasonable timeline uh, that would, for example, take into account Alicia's comments about making sure there was ample opportunity that was extended to others that may not have gotten to the point. But you could certainly um, have a cutoff point. Uh, and I think that uh, you could direct your staff to administratively develop written criteria that would go beyond the process that was followed at both uh, Canalino and Aliso with respect to uh, the discussion with the parents, the advantages, the disadvantages, and also what the evaluation process was to consist of. Obviously, if we were at square one and you were talking about the possibility of implementing this program, say, back in January, that would be something that a considerable amount of thought and attention could be given to. But, you know, we're almost in the middle of August, so um, it's unfortunate that it has to be a rush job, but if it's going to be opened up, then those criteria need to be developed um, post-haste, and I just don't think that there's time 
to bring it back to the board for you to uh, review what's being presented as opposed to having staff take the guidance that was included in Micheline's presentation tonight uh, and the guidance that comes from the CDE in terms of best practices. We can also look and see what some other districts have done, which is available on the web. Could I add one more thing that I just think is important, especially for people in the audience? Um, when this issue arose at your June 28 meeting and you took the action that you did, I don't know if it's entirely clear that, um, to my understanding, the board was not aware of all these children that were in the pipeline. And so you had little idea, no idea actually, that you were doing anything other than making a determination in the first instance that on account of budgetary issues, et cetera, that this was not the prudent thing to do. You had to balance that. And it was in the aftermath of that when everybody learned that there was a tremendous amount of concern due to the fact that so many families had been encouraged by the district and committed themselves to this process. And once that occurred, and I think this is a very important point, um, the district, the superintendent and the board acted on their own to say, you know what, we're going to reconsider this whole thing. It wasn't an acknowledgement that there was any Brown Act violation. In fact, that has never been the case. But just as you are attempting to do tonight, you wanted to do the right thing. And so you asked that it be brought back at the very next meeting. Uh, and I just think that that's an important consideration. As is the fact that it sounds like the decision you're about to reach tonight isn't based on any legal requirements or compulsion that you may or may not have to do anything, but rather once again on wanting to do the right thing and to support the community. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Greg. Greg. Do you have anything else, Terry? No, I don't think so right now. I, 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 would, I would just like to respond to one, a couple of the comments out there that really had, aren't really that pertinent to, the, to our action tonight, but just to, as a point of clarity, um, you know, we don't really have a big rainy day fund. That's, that's, there, there's money there, but it's, it's, um, there's, there's deferred maintenance money and there's, and there's uh, a little bit of reserve, but it's really not designed for, for instances like this. Uh, as far as Major U goes, um, those monies cannot be used, and they don't really offset any any um, salaries or, or teacher positions. Um, they're solely for capital improvements. Um, they don't even cover deferred maintenance, meaning you know just normal wear and tear. There's a there's a separate fund for that that has to be applied. And then as far as uh, uh, the technology, uh, Measure U dollars cannot be used for for computers. Um, we we can put in wiring but that's about it as far as technology goes so um th this this i just want to be clear i i believe we, we need to do this but it is going to be a hit to our budget and and um uh but i i, I truly believe it's the right thing to do it's by by the families that are it's the ethical thing to do it's the ethical thing to do and and moral thing to do and and i i um um you know, once again, I just I want to apologize for the angst that we've we've caused you all, um, and and you know, I really we do value uh, you. You know, you're the very families that we want to retain in our district, just just like Christy said, and and because we know you're going to be involved, and we know you're going to be participatory, and um, uh, not that all families aren't important, but but um, it's it's good to have people. Uh, that that are that involved and that caring. So thank you. I would like to add to your comments about the rainy day fund that we actually don't have. Uh, what what we actually do have and know that we have is a is a structural deficit. So we are already uh, have adopted be a budget where we know we're actually spending into that uh, reserve that we have, 
And we did that knowing that we were going to have to make cuts this next year in some of our programs. So, um, you know, it, it's it's a real tough issue now because now we'll have to consider deeper cuts. So it's it's a it's a quandary for us, and you know, it's it's tough. And that's what we have to do is balance our dollars, balance our budget, um, and make those tough choices. But uh, this is a extremely uh, unfortunate and I agree with Andy it was avoidable uh, incident that we have here and the right thing to do now is to um, move forward with this program at least as a as a pilot program for one year and and um, you know I, I understand the issues that you as families are facing as you have given up preschool spots and Maureen I know you've taken a job that you would not have probably taken if you hadn't been assured that your daughter was enrolled and I, you're not alone I'm sure so um, it's it's a big catch-22 for us but I, I, I'm in agreement that we need to do this need a motion? So I think we need a motion oh I no. I don't think we need to. Okay. I, th I think I think I mean I at this point I think it's it would be redundant and I I I, I don't think we, I think this is what we have to do. Oh, oh certainly. I just uh, I just wanted to be transparent about some funding opportunities and that's all because I know that that's a huge consideration for you. So it's at your pleasure. I'd like to see it. Yeah. You would okay. Yeah. All right. Because we all agree that um, it is the right thing to do. And uh, Maureen, Darlene, and I, and Maureen, Darlene, and Maureen, and Micheline have spent a lot of time over the last few weeks looking at a variety of different options. And one of the suggestions is going to catch some principals by surprise. So I, I do want to apologize ahead of time for this comment. Um, but one of the things that we found was that we do have carryover in principal reserve that's moved forward year after year after year. And for example, for one year, we could freeze or capture some of that money to be able to support funding the teacher for the year for the pilot. We also do have um, some option through our Title I funding now that the No Child Left Behind is behind <laughs> us. And we have a discretion to use that funding for early intervention. It's intended for student achievement. And in lieu of contracting with the Ventura County Office of Education for supplemental tutoring, we could use those funds. Again, it is restricted, and it isn't something that we want to build staffing on year after year after year. We are in a structural deficit, and your superintendent is never going to recommend to you to staff positions with monies that are precarious year after year after year, but that is another way uh, to look at this and I know as a board as a superintendent we're very concerned about the structural deficit um, and that's why this is a very difficult situation for all of us to be in because we look at it from the instructional considerations as well as the fiscal considerations um, so uh, Mar Maureen are there any other options or ideas that we had um, shared that perhaps I've left out of the conversation to be transparent I think those are the two main areas that we could identify I haven't had enough time period like even behind my belt to really take a good sweep of the budget and we're still doing our clothes so um, you know I don't know that we'll even have enough of one-time savings to cover that kind of cost but I do think that uh, the options that Micheline mentioned the reserve is a carryover that we repeatedly have year over year if we froze that one year it would cover that class um, we could redirect the Title I, which is usually um, designated for SES, but that, that's lifted this year to the early intervention program, which is, would be an expansion of TK for one year. Anything beyond that, it becomes supplanting, so we would, it would be a one-year deal. Um, and that would be offsetting the cost, not completely, co not completely covering it, because there isn't that much money in that account. Um, and then, you know, there's a possibility with um, year-end close that we might find some enough one-time monies and ending balances that would cover the additional cost so 
you know, that's really where we are now, not having enough time to get my hands around what really is in the budget. Can you uh, just refresh my memory on what the um, contract was with Ventura County? Yes, it goes from year to year, and what's expired, we terminated it, and we have not reinstated it at this time. And so those what was that for again? For supplemental educational services based on Title I, No Child Left Behind for underperforming schools. And so those funds were taken. Uh, the Title I funding from the federal government requires a percentage of that to go to professional development and a percentage of that to go to supplemental educational programs, which is intended to meet um, struggling students uh, for their achievement. And so we believe that for one year in a supplemental way that we could easily, um, I guess, explain that students in early childhood education and in early TK program uh, would be considered an opportunity for them to shore up and be more ready for school because we know, as all research supports, that earlier intervention is the best. And so this would be in line with the early intervention versus the intervention in the upper tiers when now they've been in school for a few years. So I'm sorry, we've, we've had this many coming in? Yes, ma'am. And what have we been using it for? Supplemental educational service tutoring with the Ventura County Office of Education, and that has been the but practice where? for years. Where? In our schools. Okay. Classrooms. Tell, tell After me how school. It's being used, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, every year a contract would have come to you to authorize Title I funds to um, pay uh, teachers or uh, part-time teachers or other staff that Ventura County Office of Education would hire to provide after-school tutoring on our campus. Okay, so we'd be giving up the after-school tutoring. You could do that, yes, because it's no longer required. That requirement has been lifted. It came out of the No Child Left Behind. Have we always contracted with Ventura? Yes, ma'am. Okay. For as long as I was able to look in records. Um, Jamie, you would know a lot about SES. Yes. Yay. Sorry. Hi. So this, we've only done it for two years with VCO. Um, uh, prior to that, we used, there, there were private companies that come to a fair and the parents of students who qualify for this program based on their test scores. At that time, it was the California Standards Test. And it depended upon where they fell in their um, language arts and math scores. And from that, they would go to this fair, um, and there would be people that give the tutoring. Um, we didn't find it to be very effective because we had a hard time getting results and measures from those providers, and it was happening off-site. So sometimes it was happening at the library, at the Dahlia Court, Esquilita, or wherever that. these things were happening. Um, and Bob Keating ran this program until very recently. Uh, so a couple of years ago, we started to contract with Ventura County Office of Education, which was a much better model because we used our own teachers after school um, and paid them hourly, and they were teaching their own students um, in groups of about six to eight. Um, and then we would hire instructional assistants as well for their hourly rate, and it would be twice a week for 12 weeks, and that way we were able to really closely monitor not only the curriculum we were delivering, but also the results of that intervention. And at Canalino, Brandon Sportel was coordinating that whole program. Uh, they would go down to Ventura County and get trained. Uh, we had to turn in our weekly results to the County Office of Ed, so it was very um, tightly managed. That's only been for two years, however. Um, in, t in terms of this proposal, which I'm just hearing right now, um, I, I think we are doing a really good job because of your gift of the reading intervention teachers at both, actually now at all of the schools, because we're going to utilize that for all of the students. We are already doing that during the school day, and in some cases, especially at Canalino, you know, after school hours, those tutoring services are happening now. So um, it was in addition to what already exists in the last three years, um, we have gotten much, much better at providing those additional services in small groups ourselves. Does that help? It does, but um, because I'm trying to really grasp what we're giving up if we switch money mm -hmm. from one place to another. Mm -hmm. So am I? did I understand you to say that it, you wouldn't feel a big impact if we were to? I think that what I'm saying is we're already doing that right now because you have taken it out of your budget to give us the reading intervention staff. 
um, that we didn't have four years ago. So you're kind of spending that money already in the reading intervention staff, and then I know at Canalino we're spending an additional 30000 out of site funds for more reading intervention staff. Um, so we have gotten much better as a system in providing systematic intervention for kids starting at a very, late, very early age. So this could be considered, I suppose, an extension of that systematic intervention at the TKH. So the supplemental educational services is a requirement that has been going on for years. Being with VCOE is recent, but the practice had already been in place because it was a requirement for the Title I funding. So one of the things that would be helpful, um, unless you have any other questions for us as you deliberate and take action, is um, as our attorney pointed out, keeping in mind the timeline at this point in time and knowing that other districts um, have gone through the same um, situation with respect to how to qualify students and based on what qualification and eligibility that um, I provided to you some options in the presentation with respect to date of birth um, to help guide that decision. And uh, there are some other examples. Most recently, uh, we've been provided with the Tahoe Truckee Unified School District sample, which uh, spells out um, a survey element that we don't have and we would need to create. Um, to demonstrate socio-emotional readiness through a one-hour classroom observation, which means that we would need to coordinate that with staff and bring staff in, which we would pay them to do that. Um, complete a district protocol, which um, formally we don't have other than kindergarten readiness assessments, for example, and perhaps some placement assessments in our adopted curriculum. And principal and teacher make the decision together. Um, keeping in mind that once the spots are filled, for example, that then we would not take any other enrollment. So we would also need to understand at what point we're capping uh, because, again, we don't want to come into a situation now where we have students that we don't have classes for and not enough FTEs, and now we end up um, in, a, in the same place that we're trying to avoid. I don't yeah. know how you're going to avoid that once yeah. it's opened up. And that's, I mean, because, I mean, you, there could be 20 kids that come in and bump out these people that were already promised, and so we we can't yeah, we can't I, cap I, it I right now. <laughs> yeah. So, but I also thought that lack of space isn't one of the criteria that can be used to deny Im admission. That's correct. Is that correct, Craig? If we were back in January and you were talking about uh, options that you had for establishing a program, um, doing it based on space availability would appear to be doable because it's all about local option. And we can see from the examples of what not only Truckee but some other districts have done that that is in place. But um, given where you are, now in August, not in January, uh, I don't see that limiting it to available seats really works. Thank you. Therefore, in closing, um, we would just like to have clear direction from you then so that there is no opportunity to misunderstand or um, to not spend our time very efficiently and wisely given the fact that we have school starting very soon and professional development week coming up and um, lots of um, exciting um, welcome backs and other events happening at all of our school sites. So, Is there anything else, President Schaefer? Yeah, I think... Uh yeah, I, I, I have some direction in designing the protocol. Yes. Um, so uh, as Craig stated, we need the protocol ASAP. <laughs> and um, 
so in that, here's what I'd like to see is um, the written advantages and disadvantages that are communicated to parents. Um, I want to see a clear differentiation between TK curriculum and K curriculum. I also want to know that if a child is unable to keep up with the curriculum because they ended up not being ready, that there is now an intervention plan in place for that child. Um, we're going to stay in alignment with the 1 to 24, I'm assuming. Right? Is that what our... We, no. we can't, we yeah. Um, oh, oh, yes, and and at least at least one, if not preferably two, formal assessment um, documents or forms or okay. Um, and would you like an observation uh, criteria with that as well? Uh, I, I'll leave that at the discretion of you guys, but um, the only way to fully do a true observation is if you put the child in a class with 24 other kids and see how they they do but um, so I saw Truckee use the ASQSE which is a developmental screening for social and emotional so I would take into consideration the cognitive and the social emotional readiness of the ch child I would also ask that this be translated for um, the Spanish speakers in Spanish so that they are fully aware of um, all this, you know, whether it's um, when we're talking about the advantages and disadvantages of expanded TK, you know, what have you. But I think that that's important. I, I, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I, but I also think it's important we have a cutoff date um, mm. so, that, so that we aren't having uh, families enroll mid-year. Mm -hmm. So, so thirtieth, maybe. I'm thinking, yeah, because we're two weeks out. But mm -hmm. what, uh, Craig? I'd like your advice on that. What What do you think is a reasonable, uh, defensible period of time to um, allow f for families to have time to to learn of this and and apply, um, and yet not leave this open forever? Let me ask a preliminary question. Would you expect to see the administrative protocol in place uh, well before Let's say by the, uh, first the deadline? I'm assuming that you would like to see that before there's a cutoff in post. All right. So if today's the 9th and uh, if it took... Uh, well, could I ask the question about approximately how long would staff expect that the protocol would require for preparation? Before the end of the month, a week, two weeks, I just don't know. Well, this, um, so this is going to require a team effort um, because teacher and principal would be involved and um, as our own um, language um, provides, as well as the best practice of having the principal and teacher make the decision together. We could convene a group to work on this, and then we would have to take time to administer all of this to the students. And um, it's not my preference, but we do have the flexibility of um, starting the youngsters when they turn five or from or sometime during that year it does not necessarily need to be the first day of school um, but we will we will implement your will so if if you're saying to us you want the students that qualify based on these parameters assessments and tools to begin on the first day of school then we will we will make accommodations in our schedule to make that happen honestly i i don't think you can do that with the ones you've already promised mm -hmm. they're they're in yeah. so regardless of what they what it finds on the assessment they're in but um once we open this up um 
I don't even know. I'm a, I'm I, I just <laughs> okay, yeah, because I'm 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 kind of going back and forth yeah. on that topic right now because my my thought is I agree with you. The 28 are in, and we didn't have mm-hmm. the same criteria for their um, admission. So I'm I'm almost thinking at this point we we should do what we already have done in in the admitting in. students. But this criteria needs to be developed if we're going to consider right. um, continuing sure. this program in the future. But we still should. I think we should still have a cutoff date. I agree that we need a cutoff date. Uh, so I go back to that so, question. So, so, so just under the assumption that, that we can't necessarily fairly exclude students based on this criteria, criteria um, because we've already admitted other students, then... Uh, we should establish a, a, a you know, cutoff date of you know, mid-September, end of September. Uh, Can you define what you mean by a cutoff date so I understand completely? I continue to accept new okay, uh, but so uh, the uh, cutoff date. So, so, we so we're not, gonna, <coughs> sorry, so we're not going to uh, accept okay. fa- you know, mid-year it's December. Not we're not going to ha- get another family coming in. With a Perfect. Indoor. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, so yes, and, and instructionally, that's not great for the student no, because especially when they're not quite five and then they're coming in and, and their other peers are, you know, accustomed to the routines in the classroom and now someone's coming in. But, but I think it is important that because I'm assuming there was some sort of communication with families prior to, the, to this, this episode where we, where we – uh, reached out to them and said they were admitted. So there was something where we went over the advantages and disadvantages of of enrolling their. their yes, that did take place. The, the principals assured okay, me so, that that conversation so I think took that place. Should, whatever we did there, yes, needs to be applied to any any new families. Okay. And then, do we want to say September thirtieth? September thirtieth. Okay. A, well, I want to hear from Craig what he thinks is a reasonable amount of time. I want to make sure we okay. give enough time. I think what Andy just said will work. Yeah. I don't think it should be any less than that. I'm assuming hypothetically that the, the written protocol, and I'm talking about the written part only, is developed by staff before the end of the month. That's three weeks, okay. uh, which would then allow for what I'll call publication for disbursement of the word to notify the community in English and Spanish of the availability. And then I think a minimum of 30 days after that for accepting applications, either 30 or 45 days and cutting it off at that point. But I think 30 would work. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So, um, I think we need a motion I, of some sort. I have here. one more question. Okay. Um, really, I think it's so. In your presentation, you mm-hmm. talked about that um, if you were to have a day a, a day that is a different length of time in minutes than yes. your kindergarten, you have to submit a waiver. Yes. Um, how is that done, and how long does that take? Um, Well, in the infinite wisdom of the State Board of Education, we would then be placed on their agenda, and that doesn't usually happen as soon as we submit the waiver. So I'm concerned that that's um, probably not where we are this year. That ship has sailed. Correct. Um, I sort of figured that was going to be the answer, so we don't have any options for a morning and afternoon type program either. No, other than if you wanted to do a half day, half year program and then start another half year program. I mean, that's another creative option. That's um, that would be difficult to do, yeah. considering we have a, a split TKK class now. Yeah, at, at Elisa. and you've already hired. And we've hired. I mean, it, that, you will that have would be, hired. That would be logistically mm-hmm. almost mm-hmm. impossible. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. So I, I think we really, you know. Yeah. Okay, I, that yeah. answered my question, and that's actually what I thought I was going to be told. I just. Wanted to ask the question. Yeah, at Canalina, we do have a full TK class just for clarification purposes. Oh, and Aliso, okay. Okay, so I, I just want to make sure that I'm meeting the needs. Um, what I hear, the summary that I've heard right now is that those 28 that were verbally admitted 
will be placed in our class, either fill existing spaces or open a new class to accommodate. That the protocol that was used, however it was used, is honored. And that um, the new procedure or the procedures that staff will work on administratively uh, will be available in Spanish. They will include written advantages and disadvantages, clear differentiation between kindergarten and TK, an intervention plan so that we can intervene earlier, 1 to 24, which is our goal, a minimum of two formal, uh, one to two formal assessments with a social emotional readiness screening. I'm sorry. Sorry, we can't really cap it at 24. It's got to be in alignment with yeah, uh, yes, other class sizes. I think, I think you're going over the criteria that Michelle put out, put forward, uh, and I think we've acknowledged that we can't necessarily do that because we've already admitted these other students. So so I think we... we I think she's talking about class size and, and not numbers of students enrolled. I'm referring to the bilateral contract language just so that everyone's That's clear nice. that I'm not okay. being capricious or arbitrary. Okay. Okay. All right. okay, so keeping in line with our adopted bilateral agreement for class sizes um, and that there's discretion of the principal and teacher with respect to whatever observational protocol or combined efforts of reviewing all of this data. Again, this does not include those who are verbally already accepted. This is any new students pending, correct? Uh, it's why I understand you mm -hmm. can't enforce this new protocol right. because you didn't have it for the first 20. Correct. So this is just you're you're developing it because we need it in place going forward. Um, if, in, in, in right now, the, it's kind of open and the, <laughs> If we yeah, it's, it's open and but assuming you know the, you, we're we're de trying to develop a protocol in the event that we continue or want to want to adopt permanently a portion of this program or, or set some we want to set some parameters that the board can review so we can be ahead of this okay so that's like through this year yeah, through in this preparation year. of next school year exactly. excellent okay thank you I I appreciate your patience with me through this and then a cutoff date September is 30th. the end of September September 30th. Okay. For 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 in new enrollment. For n not those that are on the list already. Well, they're already in. I'm, no, no. I'm a, yes. I'm assuming they're. You guys are all going to sign up, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. So, so this is for 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 any families that haven't enrolled. Correct. Aren't participate. Aren't aren't in school. We're not going to allow new new families, new students, to be enrolled in the early. TK program after September 30th. Mm -hmm. Not by birthday, but by, yeah. by first come, first served at that point. But until the last Friday all of September. All serve up until September. The 30th. last Friday of September. Okay. And so then, of course, we will be bringing you back new board policy then that reflects the amendments made in the education code. So you can expect that in, throughout the upcoming months. So I have a question for yes. Craig. <laughs> if this is a pilot program, do we need to amend our board policy? Thank you. Currently, your administrative regulation, uh, 6170.1, limits TK to uh, mm -hmm. children who have their fifth birthday on or before December 2. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would suggest that the motion that is going to be made uh, include reference to the fact that that regulation is being modified to allow children to, um, who qualified to enroll whose fifth birthdays fall after December 2 through the end of the school year, subject to these other considerations that we've talked about, all on a one-year pilot basis only. 
to be subsequently brought back to the board and further reviewed. I just had a question maybe for um, Michelle. If we run a pilot program, do we have to have a, um, a instrument of evaluation pre and post? Um, you know, that's, it's a good thing to bring up. Thank you. So as part of this pilot, part of the evaluation is going to be, for me anyway, how did these children do on the KSEP moving forward and um, any kind of end of year summative mm -hmm. Because then we might have some yeah documentation yeah. where we're going to yeah, continue it. With, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we know what the data shows, but I mean, but locally, for right? Us. So I wouldn't say a pre and a post, but we definitely need an evaluation plan in place as well. So basically, what did we do? How did we do it? And was anyone better off? <laughs> And that's independent of our um, of our uh, fantasy protocol that we want to develop, right? Okay. I'm sorry. What was the fantasy? I was just saying that's and that's independent of the fantasy protocol that we want to eventually develop. We are talking about having. Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, but it's a real fantasy, right? <laughs> no, but oh. but I I really <laughs> think that we need that evaluation tool for our pilot program this year. The yeah. The come all. TK expanded TK program so I think it's important to evaluate them when they enter and when they exit for our pilot program this year yes um, I'm I feel efficacious about a pilot program and study would include entrance material exams results other factors such as attendance perhaps parent involvement some surveys mid-year report and end-of-year report that would summarize all of that Great. thank you What, what was the AR again? 6170.1. Point one. I need to write it out. <laughs> Would it be an amendment? <clears throat> yeah, to amend the administrative regulation. Okay, let me. You would, you would propose that uh, this program uh, go ahead and, <coughs> and then subsequently direct that a modification to both 6170.1 and 6111 be brought back. Yeah. To the board for, for approval. The board yeah. policy. Okay. So we don't have to amend it now, but we're, we just have to say back. that it, we're, we want to have it brought back to be modified mm -hmm. you have it no that's fine <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I, gonna wing you, it and if I'm wrong yeah, or, I, I'll amend it again yeah. okay um, um, can we just discuss mm -hmm. one more thing um, I wanted to bring up the issue of um, we have this list where um, we don't know where the school of residence is mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we want anything in there about uh, my thought is I, I think that they should go to their school of residence yeah I agree mm -hmm. we've just uh, you know moved our boundaries and I, I wouldn't want them starting at one school and yeah. then you know and then being in there yeah, yeah. I agree Under district transfer, okay. Yeah. Based from from the July or the the uh, June twenty eighth yeah. meeting. Right, because okay. IDGs were incorporated into that motion, so it needed to be rescinded. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was any real controversy about it. It's just I don't want you to overlook that you need to revisit that. Okay. You can do it as a separate motion. Let's do that as a separate motion. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I move that 
um, we bring to the August 23rd board meeting uh, board policy 5111 one. Mm -hmm. and AR 6170.1 um, to include a, the amendment to provide a pilot expanded transitional kindergarten program for the 2016-2017 school year. Um, which also includes the direction given to staff to develop protocols and procedures. Chief, may I ask a question, please? Uh -huh. um, because um, I'm a board policy and amendment coming forward, and now you're asking for the list of those policies and procedures and protocols and assessments. I understood we would have time to work on that piece throughout the year. No, I think what she's saying is is that we're going to amend our board policy and AR yes. at the next board meeting. Yes. Absent the, Absent logistics. the, the logistics. Okay, correct. Yeah, two separate things there. Yes. Um, right, correct, Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. So so <laughs> so the one's not dependent on the other. Correct. So the bigger piece, the 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 board's bigger piece as a governing board are your policies and your ARs. So staff, we I am going to bring forward an amendment. Now the other pieces though are going to take some time to develop knowing that we have students that are going to be admitted and then work on the new ones coming in with the cutoff the last Friday of September. Correct? Although do you want a, a deadline of when we want to see that protocol? <laughs> Um, I do. I just we're opening. I just want to be realistic. Yeah, yeah. we're know. opening schools. We have the week of the fifteenth through the nineteenth, Monday through Friday, a week of professional development going on, and we can do it. It just it's important for you to know what we're working on when you ask us to do this. We want to do a really good job. Yeah, I just don't want it to go on a future agenda item here and it be on there for another year, like mm -hmm. some of these that Correct. are on here. So. Um. And and those other items, not because we weren't ready. We we look at them every month, every week. We sit. There's a calendar. Jolene and I review all of that. And unfortunately, there are always some other new things that are coming up that are become more priorities, and we focus on those. So, please help us with those priorities. We can come back with an amended administrative regulation and board policy for you. I just don't know reasonably with our teachers just coming in that we'll be able to pull together these um, multiple measures. Okay. I think I just would like the month of September to work on that. But the AR and the BP we need yes. by August 23rd. Yes, correct. Okay, do you want me to, re Craig? The deadline cutoff you talked about being the end of September. Mm -hmm. That, that criteria, so we're not going to base the admittance on this criteria. The criteria, we're, what we're going to use is something we've already established. Yeah, that's what I understood. So, 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 the, the, so the question is, we're, we're not going to develop a new criteria for admitting the rest of them. early TK students. For okay, so year. the criteria will not for the, the pilot. Criteria, the criteria would be for a potential yes. uh, continuation of the program after uh, after 2016 17 so the criteria that that was going to be be applied to um, any s new students is the one that was already used to to admit the students who who are on this list but so are we are, are we violating ed code though if we don't have the criteria so we don't want to do that well we already have one I'm, I'm assuming we have to have something that we. No, we don't have anything. That's we a don't. problem. That well, no. the, the fact of the matter is that while it's recommended that uh, these various protocols be put in place, it's only a recommendation by the California Department of Education, and it's entirely a local decision. So you, if you wish, you're free to go forward uh, and base this uh, admission. 
uh, into expanded TK based upon the less formal process that's been followed to date and then allow for additional time for staff to develop the type of protocol that you would wish to review in considering extending the program in the future. Well, then I, I would, so I was mistaken, I apologize. I, I thought there was some criteria that we applied. but So since there wasn't, I, I think that at the minimum, as Jamie explained, students would meet with her and then went, met with, with uh, mm -hmm. Melody and, and, and then d and determined if there was, if they were ready. And I think at the minimum we have to do that with any Agreed. additional students. Yes, in fact, some of the students also came with recommendations from their preschool teacher, so that did happen. Okay. Yeah, but that's subjective unless so, they so, have something. So, so that being the formal. case, then, then um, I, I think we can still stick with the September 30th cutoff. Mm -hmm. And did uh, Michelle want to include that additionally in the motion? In the motion? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then okay. I'll just I'll add the last point. If you also wanted to include the uh, attend the school of residence. Yeah. I have that note. You can amend if we if she leaves something out. Deadline and. Um, Students will be enrolled at their school of residence, right? Mm -hmm. If there's a moment, with your permission, can Principal Pursun approach the microphone? She may. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know she likes it. I do. Um, so I'm wondering if we could, I don't know, Craig could, could tell us, could we put at the, at, at the end of that based on space? Because we... So we may have like a huge amount at one school and a lower amount at the other school, which if that's what you would like, that's fine. Um, I, so. I don't think we can if we're saying they have to be enrolled at their school of residence. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the, so here's an issue that, you know, would, if we had more time, we could probably work it out. But, but you know, we spent a lot, we had, I think, several meetings ago, we, we, <coughs> we changed our... Um, Boundaries? Boundaries? Correct. Yes. So, and we made a point of saying that we're not going to let families, you know, inter basically split. We didn't want to split families. Correct. Up. So we've denied oh. the interdistrict yes. transfers okay. requests for TKK students that have requested. We are asking them to start at that. Your, that was your direction to start at their school of residence. I'm, I didn't know if this pilot program were any different than that. Yeah. Um, a couple oh, because of because because they're, they're, they're going to still be a TK student and then they're going to go right into kindergarten. Right. So a couple of years ago, we just had a TK, for example, at Aliso. Yes. And even if you were at the Canalino school, you went there and then back to Canalino for kindergarten. So you didn't actually stay at Aliso once you started TK. It's completely fine if you want to keep it school of residence. So just Mari and I were looking at the numbers and the and the kids, and it, it could become quite lopsided in terms of class size. I, I'm 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 okay with it not being school of residence as long as it doesn't set a precedent. I think that we would have to be very clear clear in granting yes. that that it was simply for this pilot program based on space. Yeah. If if your superintendent can weigh in on this, um, because we were very engaged on the streets and the addresses. And it was very clear by the board that you wanted everybody to return, so no intras, with very few exceptions, the discretion was given to the site. So, for example, if I have a fifth grader finishing up at a school and the third grader is there and they've been on the intra, that they're just going to continue. But any new ones coming in, especially at the K-1 TK, that they would be denied. And it was difficult because we had some families at one school who were there, their boundary changed, and now they had their little one entering in. And so we were very clean to the best to our ability, with the exception of Certain situations that involved IEPs or 504 plans are very, very unusual situations, and Principal Pursun can um, openly disagree with me. I welcome that because we wanted to implement your will and that this next year it's even going to be better, but because there was this transition happening. So I am of the opinion that these students need to attend their school of residence. 
So just going through the list um, with the School of Residence listed, mm -hmm. there's 19 Canalino and 11 right. Aliso. So there just happens to be 11 openings at Aliso and TK. So Which that works. 18 unknowns. And, and then there's 18 unknowns. So, um, so right now I see that warrants one class at Canalino. Um, which is going to be... How big is the current TK class at Canalino? Jamie. Oh. Jamie how, many? how big is the current TK class at Canalino? 17, right? That was on the PowerPoint. Oh, yeah, I'm looking at Mari. She's the queen of numbers at our district. But I believe it's a, at 15 right now. Oh, so there's... 15 and 19... We have a few 35. pending, meaning they haven't finished their paperwork, but... Um, 34, you know, 34, so you have 217 two classes. Yeah. Well... Yeah. Well, and we don't know what, about these eight. What, what, what was either. the TK final numbers last year at? 22? Yeah, okay, so... Okay. <sighs> okay. We'll so we're filling... We're fi yeah, so we're filling vacancies and not expanding another class, a teacher, or, well, you'll vote on that. That's not at all. No, 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 that, no, 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 mm -mm. no, we're, it's basically open enrollment is what okay. we're doing. It, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's whoever's, right. it's, op it's, everyone who by shows September up by September 30th, 30th gets in. That's, that's what we're saying. So we may but be if but if I live in Aliso and there's room at Canalino, then I get into Canalino because this is an exception. Is oh, I see what you're saying. You see what I'm. So yeah. Well, I mean, we're not gonna. So what you're saying is we have two twenty four student classrooms at one school, but we have more students coming to that school, and there's openings at the other. School. Yes. Let's and uh, parents have said to me that they'll they don't mind they'll go to whichever school has the space and correct yeah <laughs> yes they're sitting here in this room not to call anyone out but <laughs> they will go to the school with the vacancy for that year and then return to their home residence school I, I think we're opening a can of worms if we don't keep them at their school of residence. And just increase the class size? Or find a room. Well, we have to increase the class size because you're not going to, you're not going to have, I mean, that Oh, there's going to, in open enrollment, there's going to be 20 more kids come in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> until we know the numbers on September yeah. 30th, I don't think we can make any other yeah, I, I don't, yeah, decisions I, on class size. We probably size. are going <laughs> to have to just revisit that at some okay. point. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I th I think um, I, I'm with Michelle though. I think that we need to have the school of residence um, as our priority. policy, right? If it obviously, you know, if if you need to bring it back to us for discussion at some point, then we can talk about okay. it. Okay. So we will do everything to place the child in the school of residency first. Okay. By date of birth of these that are here. No date of birth. <laughs> no date of birth. Okay. No. So all of these. And anybody who else who shows up by September in 30th. In their school of residency. Unless that school is filled, they will go to the open space at the other school. No. We'll, okay. We're going to we'll revisit that. that, that at the, at we're gonna, okay. We'll revisit that if, if it becomes an issue. And, and we can we can manage that. We, we can be very flexible at the beginning of the year. We can in, add instructional assistance if we get larger from the site budget and um, just support the students and the teacher as necessary. And you have the option of taking over room 39 from the preschool, right? Um, I believe that we decided that we, at our last meeting, we decided that wasn't going to happen, that because CCP was going to retain that room. Um, the Micheline, the meeting we had with, with the Maria. When we, we met as part of this planning group, that Maria was hoping to use that as the afternoon after school. Well, she can still use it for after school, but for the daytime, it doesn't need to sit there. It can be well, used. Well, I think I don't want to speak for her, but at, at the last meeting, she was hoping to use it for both purposes, and so we agreed that I, 
in this scenario that we would not use that room because she's not back until the 17th. And and we also said that we would not make decisions until the board took action Correct. tonight. So if it's your direction that we use 39, then we there's going to have to be some flexibility. Yeah. With this. So I have a plan. Other, I'm I'm fine. Okay. okay. Good. I trust Good to that go. you have a plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm on it. Barnaby and I, we're going to see. I, we've, we've already I'm got it handled. I, thank you. Nice haircut. I, um. <laughs> I'm going You're for distracting me. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. Need a a I amend my motion <laughs> that we bring to the August 23rd board meeting board policy 5111 for review and administrative re regulation 6170.1 that shall include a pilot early transitional kindergarten program for the 2016-2017 school year that includes a September 30th enrollment deadline and that students who enroll in the early transitional K program will be enrolled at their school of residence. Can I get a second? I'll second. I'll second. Oh, <laughs> that's good. Do we want any more, dis have any more discussion? No. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> that was very painful, but thank you all for. Thank you. Being patient with us now. Intra district. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, so well, I got a lot written on it, but I'll rewrite it. So for now you. we have. Uh, so so the, now we've got to uh, revisit the inter district transfer um, that was part of that June twenty eighth decision. And I. <laughs> trying to remember. I'm trying to remember that, but. Um, can we look in Actually, the minutes? Let me see. I might have Craig can probably refresh our memories. Can you go up to the podium and refresh us, Craig? <laughs> or Micheline, if you... Yes, of course. Um, it sounded like you just took care of that in the fell swoop, but if it needs to be a standalone, um, I, I think, if Craig, we just need them to reiterate um, the school, the issue of the students attending their home school. Not, but not just specifically to TK. No. It has to apply to all students. Yes. So your June 28 motion that you approved and have now rescinded <clears throat> including, included the following language. Only approve intra-district transfers that do not trigger a movement in staffing. So if you wish to reiterate that, all you need That's to do is make that identical motion. Okay. Yeah, I agree that, with that. You want to make that motion? Yeah, I will. Uh, I move that uh, intra-district transfers only be approved if they do not uh, trigger uh, an increase in s need for staff. Is that clear enough? Second. Discussion? Is that clear enough, Darlene? Oh, we've we've held to that. That was the easier part. <laughs> okay, all in Thank favor. you. Aye. 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 That was Michelle seconding that. Yeah. Okay. Move on to item four: presentation on our standardized visitor sign-in sheets. And we have co-chair of our safety committee, Mr. Gloger, here. Barnaby. Me too. I have to start bringing glasses if you print stuff out like this anymore. Glasses? <laughs> All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me here. 
For our viewers at home, uh, my name is Barnaby Gloger, and I am here today as the Pupil Services Administrator, um, uh, in which I serve as the Safety Officer for the School District and Co-Chair of the CUSD Safety Committee as well as chair of the Pupil Services Task Force. And so I am presenting today uh, in collaboration with the task force and the safety committee um, a uh, informational presentation on a standardized visitor sign-in sheet forms um, that we are uh, researching, investigating, and looking to um, to have standardized throughout the school district in all the school sites. We, um, we came up with these sign-in sheets with the following in mind. Uh, school safety, student safety, staff safety, all, all community stakeholders that step foot on campus. Uh, we um, are also keeping in mind student confidentiality as a priority as well as the importance of showing consistency site to site, district wide, and uh, good customer service. We want, uh, we want to be aware of people's uh, feeling welcome and informed and uh, um, uh, welcome professionally at each school site. So here we go. So currently, we have a variety of different practices at each site. Um, it varies from some sites who um, sort of have a check-in, visitor sign-in sheet that's lightly used to others that um, I know at Carpenter at High School, Mr. Cornejo and I developed a, uh, um, a visitor sign-in sheet protocol in which uh, we um, made sure everyone checked in at the front office and uh, provided their uh, proof of identification, collateral while they are visiting the site. Um, again, you know, so we're just, we're looking at a lot of different um, types of uh, ways people are checking in and signing in as visitors at our different sites. So here are just a couple examples of different sign-in sheets that have been used at sites this past school year. Um, if you can see, um, you'll notice that, especially where it's the one that's filled out on the top, um, it shows the name of the visitor. It shows if they're visiting a student, the student that they're visiting. Keep that in mind as we discuss FERPA in a little while. We also have a, different ways of recognizing who are visitors on our sites or who's anyone on our sites. Uh, these are different visitor um, badges and stickers that are used at the different sites. Um, and, and I think one thing that the CUSD Safety Committee found as it researched this was we are looking at a lot of great practices. Um, you know, we, I just want to highlight Principal Pursun and Canalino um, do a very effective job in checking in visitors, especially on special events uh, when they uh, have extra staff checking in visitors. So, so there's a lot of good practices out there. Uh, the issue we notice is that they're not the same at each site, and there are some that are not compliant with current policy and um, federal regulations. So looking at our board policy, we see that our governing board encourages parent and guardians and interested members of the community to visit the schools and view the educational program. And I think that's important in this conversation is that we, we want people to feel welcome. We want people to participate. We want parents on our campus involved. Uh, we're not um, advocating for uh, keeping people out. We just want to make sure that the people that come on campus are safe, just as are the students and the staff. And our current board policy supports that. We also are looking at minimal interruption to our classes, our school activities, and um, want to ensure safety of all those involved. Our administrative regulations give us specific criteria, steps to do to check in visitors. Um, there is a registration procedure in our, our admin regs 
we are to collect a, a person's name, uh, address, occupation, age, if they're less than 21. Um, the purpose for being on school grounds, proof of identity, uh, and other information. This is all connected to our California Penal Code. As I mentioned earlier, the Pupil Services Task Force, which spent the last year um, looking at how we um, uh, use our student records to ensure that we are maintaining confidentiality. Uh, one thing that was um, brought to our attention that we looked at was our sign-in sheets and that any student record needs to be uh, protected. And so having a student name on a sign-in sheet when that parent is visiting, um, is visiting a class to visit a student or a agency is visiting that student to interview them whether it's law enforcement or child protective services. If we have a student name on that form that's visible to the next visitor that comes along, that's, that's a violation and that's, that's not okay. We, need, we have a responsibility to protect that information. So again, this sign-in sheet is, uh, has been developed to address that as well. I, uh, I'm very fortunate. I get to serve, I get to wear a lot of different hats, as you know, um, principal, administrator, um, safety officer, best hat of all is parent, and, uh, and I think there's a few more. But, um, but I've had the privilege of arriving to Canalino Elementary School as a parent, to Summerlin Elementary School as a parent, and completing the visitor sign-in sheet, getting welcomed by the staff, which is wonderful. Um, and as a parent, if you have students in multiple sites, um, it is interesting to have a different check-in procedure and have different visitor sign-in sheets. And I think if we can, um, if we can standardize, it will be, um, from a parent's perspective, it'll show that we are working together uh, every site. It'll show um, <coughs> consistency, professionalism, um, and, uh, and it'll just be nice because you'll know what to expect when you walk into a site. As a... Uh, staff member when I visit other sites, which I do more and more now, um, it's also nice to have consistency and know what to expect. Um, and I think that the more consistent we are, the less um, negative feedback we would receive if people just know this is what you're going to expect when you're there. So, so that's important as well. So moving on, as we look at this sign-in sheet through different lenses as board members, as staff members, as parents, as agencies visiting. Um, I, I want to walk you through uh, this sign-in sheet from those different perspectives. On the back of your packet, for those in the room, there is a large size, a normal size version of the sign-in sheet so you don't have to squint so much. I apologize if anybody's watching this at home. And oh cool, I have a red light here. Oh, actually you have to move the mouse. The light won't show up on television. Oh, okay. Just Okay. So right now I'm gonna walk through the, the sign in sheet as long as there aren't any questions up to this point or any anything. Okay. So hover. Okay. All right, so you, um, you walk into a uh, school site at Carpenter Unified School District and you're greeted by our uh, office coordinator, secretary, recep uh, secretary, receptionist, registrar, and uh, they say welcome to our school. Um, please fill out our visitor sign-in sheet. Now, when you walk in with those different lenses as a parent, as a staff member, you're going to come in at basically four different types of a visitor. So visitor is either a CUSD staff person who has a red badge that I'm wearing here. That's one. The second would be a, uh, a non-staff person, so a parent, an agency member, but someone who is a re routine visitor who has, and this is part of uh, what we want to do with the sign-in sheet, develop a routine visitor uh, form or application. So it's, you know, I think of, um, I, I made many visits to Canalino last spring. So um, I would say, Principal Pursuit, I'd like to be a routine visitor, so maybe I'll fill out uh, a form or something we haven't developed yet, which shows my information on it, and I get to keep an orange badge. 
So now we have the red badge for CUSD staff, an orange badge for um, routine visitors, maybe parents who volunteer every Tuesday afternoon, um, uh, community agency members that we work with that come regularly. So, so now we have two levels of visitors. The third is a, uh, a person that we know who is visiting the campus, so a parent that the, uh, the office staff has seen before. We're so fortunate in the small community to know everyone. Um, it really is basically every parent of anyone other than a kindergartner on the first day of school. <laughs> so, um, so those visitors would, be, would still get the same visitor badge um, as, as a, a normal visitor, a first time visitor, but they would be known by the office staff and therefore vetted. Um, they've already, we, we would be able to rule out any reason why they should not be on our campus. Um, so these are the vetted um, visitors who we know but are not the routine visitors. That was the orange badge. So, so with this badge system, and, and I hadn't mentioned this earlier, um, you know, we, we saw the slide earlier of all the different stickers and badges and things like that. With, with a standardized sign-in sheet, um, we really would want to look at badges at every site, um, much like this one, maybe on a, a lanyard around your neck. So um, uh, we'd look at uh, the red badges that all staff would have anyway, the orange badge for routine visitors, and a, a bright badge that you could see easily for other visitors. I, uh, I, I, I like to ride a bicycle. I bought a jacket once. The color was yellow, but it was called Screaming Yellow. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you could see this thing coming from two miles away. So, Screaming Yellow, whatever color that, that is easy to see, that would be the color of a badge for visitors. Um, some of the sites have a white one now. Um, but, again, if we could do Screaming Yellow, I think that'd be fun. So, um, but this way, every adult on a campus would have a visitor badge. I'm sorry, it would have a badge, um, whether it was the staff badge, the red one, the orange badge for routine visitors, or the screaming yellow badge for, um, for other visitors. What about the people who are kind of random visitors? Are they that would be the, the screaming yellow. Oh, that so the random visitors, the one-time visitors. Oh, I see. You're, you're asking about the Oh, what if there's the somebody one. who you don't recognize? And is there a fourth badge? Sorry, I, I got off topic. Yeah, so, um, so there's just the three badges. Okay. But you've got, if you're not a routine visitor or a staff member, you'd have the Screaming Yellow badge. And there's two levels. There's the visitor that's vetted who's known. Um, and then there's a visitor who the staff has never seen before. And that's the visitor in which they would be um, asking more questions and um, getting more information. So that's where I'm going to walk you through the sign-in sheet. But I first wanted to I mention the badges and the sort of different levels of visitors. So okay. sorry, I jumped ahead. Oops. Okay, so on our sign-in sheet here, visitor walks in, is greeted by our office staff um, or whoever's in the front, and um, they are asked to fill out the visitor sign-in sheet. If they are a first-time visitor, they are asked to fill out every um, category. If they are a vetted visitor or a routine visitor or a staff member, they will be told to only fill out the categories that are starred. So if you look at um, starred and in the, in the black. So if you look at the, uh, the visitor sign-in sheet, um, anyone would want to fill out the time in and time out. They need to fill out their name and address. No, sorry, not their address. So, time in, time out. Uh, we need, I visit. need to fix this form so it shows a star by the name. So we're we're in development, we're in progress, a uh, process here. So they would have to um, fill out anything that's starred, and on here we will update it to have a star by the first, middle, and last name, by the student name and relationship. So. It, um, if you have the student name on there, though, isn't that the FERPA violation? So that, thank you for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. So the black on this form, this, this isn't the forms that would be used. So um, the forms that would be purchased for the sign-in sheet would be um, uh, carbon copy. Yes, so everything yeah. in the black is the carbon copy. So when you write on it, you can't see it, mm -hmm. except for the copy underneath that the office staff would see. Okay. So as they're filling it out, they're going to be in discussion with the office staff. Uh, you know, who are you here to see? Go ahead and fill that out there. And so they'd know that. Then if we needed to check or look 
closer, then we would flip up the one page to see the page underneath it that has all the information. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when a visitor comes next, all that's in black they won't be able to see. So that, that um, uh, keeps that information confidential, so thank you for mm -hmm. asking about that. Um, again, so, uh, so routine visitors, district employees, and vetted visitors will fill out everything that's starred, including the name and student if they're visiting a student. If it's a first-time visitor, the office staff isn't familiar with that visitor, they would ask them to fill everything out. Um, and during that time, the, if it's a parent, let's say, or um, if there's any way to check, we have Aries in the bottom right-hand corner, so that would be the vetting that the office staff would look under Aries at that contact person. They'd either be in the emergency contacts or parent, especially if they were visiting a student or having a student released to them. Um, and that way they could, the staff member could see if there were any constraints in that uh, person visiting the student or taking that student from school. So it helps um, ensure that we are keeping our students safe and uh, in that regard and that the right people are visiting the students. Well, how do we handle that now? How do we handle that now? Yeah. Well, different on every site. Um, how do we assure that, the, you know, whoever's checking a student out is legit? Well, you, usually if we didn't already know that we would check areas to make okay. sure that there were, um, we check the contacts, uh, the parent names, emergency contacts. If there are, in, in some rare situations, that there was um, a restraining order or anything like that, that information, if we had that, if we had the legal paperwork, that would be entered into ARIES so that the office staff would see this. That process is happening, as far as we know, but again, this standardizes it across the district. So it will, by having this form, it not only does it help the visitor fill out this information, but it helps the office staff follow these certain steps to make sure they've crossed all the T's, dotted all the I's, and, and checked Aries. Um, so they have, have completed this process, and it's the same site to site. Is um, collateral the ID? So with collateral, what we've seen at other districts is they ask for a ID or keys or something equivalent, some some, some, um, something that they um, would keep uh, in a secure spot in the office and give back to the person when they left collateral for the ID badge so the person doesn't walk off with the ID badge. And ID badges, um, you know, don't cost a ton, but I know, I've heard it at sites, um, they seem to walk away. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's, it's common for, to start with 20 ID badges and by the end of the year be down to five. Mm -hmm. Well, it's probably good to keep the ID anyway, or have them pull the ID just to compare what they're putting on there anyway. <laughs> if, right? if, yeah, with, if with asking for the ID, yeah. And so, so the Not visitor, vetted, the first yeah. time visitor, um, the, the office staff would ask to see their ID, yeah. um, and that would help, you know, confirm the information that they're filling out is accurate. So I think, I think we talked about this a year or so ago when, when we started, you know, the whole sign-in procedure. I still have a, a um, and I w I'd like to see how it's worked out, but with our with our um, mobile, you know, staff, the, the ones that, tran that I guess transient staff, the ones that go from site to site, but in particular grounds and maintenance, I, I just see so much inefficiency with with a um, you know one of the you know someone coming to to fix a pipe having to go to the office, especially at the high school. Mm -hmm. or the middle school where they could come in the back gate or they could come in a side gate and go fix something quickly they've got to go to the front office go you know show check in and then go to their their spot and mm -hmm. and i just i i mean i i just see dollars there mm -hmm. um and i have we had any feedback f from from uh some of our crews some of our yeah. staff yeah we we've been discussing that you know all year um actually since the last two years um, how to accomplish that how to be efficient um, but also how to make sure that we know who's on our campus at all times um, you know a big part of that is always having a badge on I think that's something we're going to have to uh, to continue to promote and make sure that that's happening um, but no we've we've talked with the different facilities directors and supervisors quite a bit about that we've thought of different 
solutions and ways to do that, whether it's them calling ahead uh, or having a separate sign-in area or sheet um, where they sign in on their own. Um, we've looked at different options. I think uh, one thing is if there is an emergency while they're on campus, we need to know that they're on campus for uh, our safety as well as their safety. Um, you know, in conversations I've had with facilities, if, uh, if they're hurt while operating heavy machinery or doing work and they haven't checked in, no one would know about that, that they were on campus. So that could put them at, at risk. Um, well, so there's a lot a, of things a to phone consider. phone call would be the easy. I mean, everybody's got cell phones. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to a lease, so you call up Cindy Houston, say, hey, Cindy, I'm going to be mowing the backfield today. And she, you know, makes note of that on the sign-in sheet. Mm -hmm. Rather than them having to get out of their truck, walk to the front office, and then, and then, um, you know, and then walk back to their, their truck and then, and then go into the campus. I, I just, that to me seems like a practical um, logical way of handling it rather than, you know, because, I mean, it's, we are a very small district. It's not like everybody, I mean, everybody knows who are the staff members, especially the grounds and the, and the maintenance guys are. And, and uh, that seems like it would be a legitimate way to, to, to handle that and know who's on your campus. Um, and then they can call and say, I'm leaving now. Mm -hmm. But I can just see someone coming to fix something. They check in, go fix it, need something, go check out, then come back, check in. You know, I, it just, if, if we're really going to follow the letter of the rule here, the rule could really be abused in a, in a lot of ways. Um, and it just makes it really inefficient. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes it very inefficient. Yeah. Well, this is, a, this is an ongoing process. I think we're still... We're still in the midst of figuring out the best way to do this. So, you know, it's good feedback that we can continue to look at and, and come back and present to you um, some different ideas and solutions for that. Um, I think that what, um, the, what the challenge may be is, is ensuring that people are calling on their way in and calling on their way out um, and that that's being recorded. I think that... Um, you know, having, having been at, at Carpentry High School for six years as the assistant principal, um, you're out and about on campus and you're seeing the different people that are working on campus, so there's that. Um, but at the same time, having the staff check in at the office allows conversation with the on-site administration of finding out why they're there and it, and it helps communication, so that's a, a bonus of well, no, doing I see that, that as well. Bonus, so I can, I can just see, yeah. see our the the man hours to complete a task go up mm -hmm. if, if, if you know you may you may gain something with through the communication process but but until that until you can uh, you know uh, apply a, um, a savings to that mm -hmm. I, all I see are costs associated with with someone taking you know however long it takes to check in go then go to their to their work area then come check out and then leave yeah uh, that, that's that's logistically i just see that as a is a is a, a a problem mm -hmm. um i understand that the the what you're after but i think we need to revisit that so that we can develop a uh something that, that satisfies the the concerns or the the safety aspect or the communication what have you, but also allows the the staff member to um, perform their work in an orderly, efficient way. Mm -hmm. And you're just referring to the CUSD staff with facilities, right? Not a a person coming to do facilities work that is a non-staff member, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm not. I'm not referring to any, anything other than our our, our current staff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or you know, our facilities grounds. Um, custodial, I don't know. They usually are assigned to site, so they're there and they're not. They're not. They're not, they're not moving around. Mm -hmm. um, that's 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 really my, you know all I'm talking about. Okay. It is something to think about too, though, when we get into large major U projects. You can have a lot of. People. We will, but normally, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, um, I believe that construction crews aren't 
they, they basically will have, um, they're not going to be on the part of the campus where students are when the work will be isolated, right? Uh, probably fenced off, <clears throat> yeah. probably. But I'm not sure if every that's true of every project because, you know, you think about where some of those portables are going. I'm not sure that, I don't know, we'll have to yeah. see. But I do believe that there'll be some sort of fencing. I'm thinking back to the middle school when you know, that was done. We'll, we'll have to talk to Dave Do something about to that. keep the students out of the construction area. There's probably some protocol that yeah. have to do. Oh. I mean, I know there's fencing, but there's probably, I, I'm sure there's a sign-in procedure. I know there's a sign-in procedure when yeah. you're working on a school facility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they all do have particular badges, so they already are badged and they have to be up. Um, and just want to mention that in speaking with Chris about this, um, the supervisor, he um, is working with the facilities and the custodial and the maintenance staff to help them understand that while it may seem like a shortage or of time or a stoppage or I have to slow down because I have to do this and go through the front office, he's actually brought in some very... I think illuminating and fair, reasonable reasons why it's important to do that um, for their own safety, in fact. But we can continue to discuss that and, in fact, ask him to come and continue this conversation from his perspective. Um, and I think he makes a lot of sense that it may appear inefficient, it's just a couple of minutes, um, but he has made some really good comments about that. And I would like to, I'd ask that you listen to his opinion about that I'd be and, happy and to he, hear him. he and pardon uh, me I'd be happy to hear yes him. Mm -hmm. I think it would help and he and David Winnegar um, you know will participate in the CUSD safety committee and uh, you know last year uh, David and, and the uh, uh, facility supervisors were able to discuss a lot of those different ideas um, you know ideas of uniforms or, or shirts or things like that to help identify facility staff so we we uh, We've got a lot of work to do to, to work out the finer points, but, um, but I just wanted to present the sign-in sheet right. to just um, make you aware of uh, some different things that have developed in, in collaboration with the task force and the safety committee. Um, but I also want to you know, take this time to acknowledge that um, we've had a lot of support and help, especially from the different um, representatives from our community partners. Um, uh, City of Carpinteria, Mimi Aduello, uh, Fire Department, Carp Summerlin Fire Department, Richard Evans, and uh, Jeff Dearnalis from the Santa Barbara County Sheriff Department, as well as Dave Moore from Hope Net Carpinteria, um, Dan Flynn, uh, new <coughs> emergency manager with the um, Santa Barbara County Exec Executive Cabinet. We're really lucky that that they have um, you know been able to fit in their day the CUSD safety committees this, uh, meetings this last year and help advise us and, and give us up their thoughts um, and suggestions as we've developed this uh, sign and sheet as well as lots of other um, uh, mm -hmm. safety minded uh, policies protocols and and just different plans so um, and then I also on this last slide included the names of all the the people that contributed at the COSC safety committees um, and the pupil services task force. So um, really lucky to have everybody here and, and uh, um, look forward to this year ahead with the, the safety committee. And then also each site has their own safety committee. So and, and hour zero and how that will all play out. So um, lots of big exciting things ahead um, to keep everybody safe. So so thanks for your attention to this. Any um, any other questions or, or yeah, feedback had, or suggestions? Yeah, I had a couple. Um, right here, you might want to put personal information. If you're going, you might want to just say visitor personal information. If it's going to be cut off, you know, it says confidential visitor sign-in sheet. But then when you look at personal information, one would think that you're putting the personal information of the student or whoever that you're going to go see versus you, especially since it asks for the first, middle, and last. And then a time in and the time out, if you're actually taking a student off campus, shouldn't that be somewhere here? I know that would probably be reflective in the purpose for the visit. I'm taking my kid to an MD appointment, but then on the time out, should there something be there that student left at the same time? Yeah. So we actually have a, a student a release separate. law. You have another one? That's oh. similar, but it's, it's a oh, separate. Oh, okay. Because I know like at the binder. middle school, it was all inclusive. So that's yeah. why, you know, when you sign one line, it was in, out, and you took your kid with you. 
And I know that's what you're trying to, um, you know, do now, make it more standard. So this is just for the visitor to this come in and out? This is just for visitors, out? yeah. Oh, okay. So. Great. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, we'll move on to superintendent's report. Okay, well, I'm going to beg you for some patience because um, in spite of the fact that it's August, I have quite a lot of information to share. Um, so thank you for that. I also want to join Barnaby and commend and acknowledge the partners of the safety committee. The staff were not compensated. So all of the hours that they invested after work until 4.30, 5 o'clock, in some cases 6, um, they did that as volunteers. And we were really, really excited to be able to count on the consistent um, attendance of Richard Evans of the Carpinteria Summerland Fire Department and um, these community and allied partners, which also include Mimi, Aduelo, the city of Carpinteria, Jeff Dionela, Santa Barbara County, and um, Dan Flynn of the County Executive Office of Santa Barbara, and then Dave Moore with HopeNet of California. And I just think that this has been a very um, great representation of multi um, agencies and, and, and stakeholders this year. And I was not able to uh, in, uh, attend every single meeting, um, but I was able to meet when I wasn't available with um, the co-chairs and some of the smaller, a smaller group, and um, they're really to be commended on their outstanding efforts. A lot was accomplished this year, so I want to thank them. I attended my first uh, Girls Inc. of Carpinteria board meeting as a new board of trustee, and I'm really looking forward to learning and adding value to the mission that supports being strong, smart, and bold. And so this has been truly an honor as a new person in the community, only been here for a year, uh, to have been invited and then to go through that vetting process, and I'm truly um, overwhelmed with their confidence and support. Great exciting news uh, for our schools, uh, especially uh, Summerland and Aliso, and um, our family school and Carpent and Canalino. We have been given official approval from Sage for the Sage Garden Project Grow Package, which includes full funding for the school year, $12,500 per site for 10 hours per week of the garden education services, with the option of applying for three consecutive school years of continued funding. It includes lesson plans for grades K-6 focused on nutrition and garden education, training at the Edible Schoolyard Academy in Berkeley for garden educators, a cooking cart for each site that includes small appliances, pots and pans, food prep tools, dishware, and uh, soft goods like dish towels, hot pads, mitts, casserole towels, and cleanup towels. John Clark asked to meet with me of the Bauer Foundation, and he did so because Girls Inc. applied for funding. And so John Clark, in a three-way partnership, met with me to run through me uh, their uh, intended outcomes of a grant. They've requested $15,000, and the purpose is to provide paths to overcome the divide between, between increased academic achievement and well-being for low-income Latina young women. Uh, so we're really excited about that, and I appreciate being viewed as a resource um, with the foundation for the funding. It um, also intends to build academic self-confidence, self-exploration, and growth. We will be looking at the CASP scores, homework grades, and dibbles at the third grade literacy benchmarks for collecting the data of the success of the program. On July 28th, I attended the Partnership in Education annual retreat as an incoming director on the board of directors. I um, was thrilled to also be asked to participate at that level. In education for extending this opportunity to me and for their confidence in my talents um, and um, looking forward to our continued partnership there. Explore Ecology received a grant from the Sage Garden Project to fund 
uh, Aliso and Canalino schools for 10 hours per week. And I especially want to thank Alex Bereda, the school garden program director, and the executive director, Lindsay Johnson, for their efforts as well. We're excited to implement the uniform sign-in sheet this year and um, thank the committee based on their consensus for forwarding that to me. Uh, appreciate Barnaby's leadership and taking that on and he really has a passion um, for this and models for all of us. Our law enforcement agencies have been involved as well as our county emergency personnel and August 15th from 9 to 12 will be the training for identified staff in hour zero. We're using that trainer of trainers model and so then those folks will go and train site and departments as well. With respect to the principal vacancy, we received 23 applications and interviewed six finalists. The panel was comprised of Aliso and Summerlin members, including Judy Holler, Sarah Monroe, Cindy Husted, Felicity Moore, Brett Weinberg, Mari Hornback, and Shannon Coletti. In addition to the oral interview, the candidates completed a writing prompt which required analyzing school climate data. And we're excited to welcome Michelle Fox um, this evening, and if it's appropriate, I'd like to request her to come to the podium and make some introductions. Certainly. Thank you. I was wondering who was hanging out for this I meeting. Was. Yes. <laughs> I started yeah. figuring it out. Great. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm Michelle Fox. Um, I'm thrilled to be in Carpinteria. I'm, I'm looking so forward to starting and working with um, the students at Aliso and Summerland. Um, I come with 24 years of experience in education. And um, I started out in Stockton and um, was in Guadalupe for 15 years, um, did some administrative work in Tascadero, and now I'm here and really, really excited to be here. Um, I've, moved, I've sold my house in Napomo and I've moved to Ventura, and so um, just, I'm thrilled. Great. Welcome. Thank I'm you. Glad to have you. Thank you. I'm real excited. And Michelle dove right into the tears training for the therapeutic learning class at Aliso. So she's, um, she's in. <laughs> we're, we're thrilled to have her. We had a very busy summer district-wide. Uh, in addition to uh, providing very successful summer programs for our students, we also had a number of summer projects that took place on the campuses. So I'm trying to be brief, but I think it's important for you and our community to know that as far as the summer activities for programs, we had extended school year for our students with IEPs. We had the, Can the Carpinteria High School Summer School in session. ACES Summer Academy, Fun in the Sun at Aliso through the United Way, Safety Town at CCP with Maria Fisk, Track Meets at the High School, Summer Institute with Krista Munisic, and I happened to speak with her, and I just, you know, can't tell you um, again, over and over again, the amazing talents we have in our, our teachers um, in our district. I'm continuously impressed, and um, a number of us at this table, in fact, continually speak about um, their gifts and um, how they motivate us to even be better leaders through, um, through, through their work as teachers. We had football and cheer camps, track meets, summer enrichment, more track meets in the evenings, and um, the list goes on. And then our summer improvement projects at the sites that included exterior painting upgrades at main campus CCP, multi-purpose building roof replacements at the middle school with the upper gym roof replacement at the high school, which means the upper section of the gym, not to be confused with a lower gym, classroom wings C and G and roof replacement at the high schools, gym floor refinishing at the high school and the middle school, Irrigation maintenance and repairs at all sites. Multi-purpose room interior upgrades at Canalino. Concrete slab removal at Aliso. Phi bar and place structures at Aliso and Canalino. Multi-purpose room floor refurbishing at CCP at Maine. And then district-wide asphalt paving and crack seal and slurry seal and striping of parking lots, weed spraying and field renovations at CMS and Aliso. And um, if that's not enough, um, 
I look forward to taking vacation in um, September or October this year. <laughs> so thank you to all. Great, thank you. Okay, where are we here? No, no public comment. Everyone left. Okay, uh, move on to <coughs> move on to item uh, F, educational services, and we're being asked to look at a contract with MyDoc Productions LLC and the Carpenter Plaza Playhouse. Yes, and I think we can defer to Dr. Shannon Coletti um, about this, and I had given you some information ahead of time as well, trustees. Your first meeting. I know, it's my first meeting. I'm so excited. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, it's so Maureen's first meeting too, isn't it? No, yeah, second. Oh, I wasn't yeah. here. I wasn't here <laughs> for your first meeting. Um, so I had the opportunity to view the trailer for uh, the 67-minute documentary Screenagers. And uh, after viewing it, mm -hmm. then they sent us the link and so I sat and watched uh, the, entire tr the entire documentary, which was incredible. And it starts out, well, I guess I don't want to go into it. Yeah, we don't want to give away the plot. We don't want to <laughs> give away the plot. But it is, um, it talks about our students uh, it, starting in elementary, middle school, moving on to high school, and how they're dealing with technology, cell phones, iPads, and it just goes through the whole gamut. And so as a parent and a teacher and as um, an administrator, I think it would be really beneficial if we brought it to our community. So what we'd like to um, propose is um, renting the DVD, renting out the Carpinteria Theater, and having an evening event for the community and um, working with the, ed the foundation to do some type of, um, uh, what did we say, uh, a fundraiser. Oh, it's actually not with the Carpentry Education Foundation at this time. I'm not. Um, ad, I'm not at liberty to disclose the donor. I can tell you that later. However, I have full confirmation that this will be funded by donor friend funds in the local community, and I can get back to you about that. Does it? Does it just without spoiling? Is it going <laughs> to uh, how how screen time affects brain yes. development? And yes. Okay. A and to the point of addiction and recovery mm -hmm. programs now. Mm -hmm. It was really, I mean, I, I, it was a wonderful documentary. That's so great. I can, I've been harping on my kids, like, <laughs> for the last year. Good. So well, we'll see you great. there. You will. You'll that's see my great. kids there for sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, what we'd like to propose is that we have it in, in the evening for all of our uh, parents and community. And then the next day, they'll allow us 24 hours or 48 hours to show it at the middle school and the high school. So we could bring in those students. And we would, um, given your permission, we'd like to proceed with that. And the packet comes with teaching uh, lesson plans so that the teachers will receive that ahead of time to assist with preparing the students. And so there will be some, you know, there, there's actual instructional alignment um, there. We also are excited because this is part of the safety committee's concern also with respect to the digital um, vulnerability that our children are experiencing these days. And we also, if um, you, you approve this, we could create a panel discussion to be held after the documentary. Which is, would be our goal. We'd like to have a panel discussion for those who would like to stay. Yeah, I'm in favor of it. Yeah. Any emotion? Can I move to approve the contract with MyDoc Productions? Is your mic on? Nope. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I move to approve the contract with MyDoc Productions. LLC. I'll second. And the Plaza Playhouse. And the Plaza yes, Playhouse. So I'd like to amend your motion. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a lot of motions no, tonight. Right. <laughs> so contract with Plaza Playhouse and My Doc Productions. Mm -hmm. All right. Second. Oh. All right. Wow. <laughs> I think that's my first motion ever. Um, all in favor. Aye. 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 And the Playhouse has been extremely generous, so they've really worked well, with us on the... Peter, pretty amazing people. A so, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, everyone's excited that, you know, we've spoken to folks informally pending board approval, and we have had such tremendous support to do this, so thank you. Okay. 
So we'll move on to uh, G, business operations facilities and warrants. I move, oh, go, no, you go ahead. I move we approve and ratify the warrants for July 9th through July 31st, 2016. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, item two is <coughs> a uh, amended, we're being asked to approve amended resolution to name Maria Fisk as the authorized representative for Maine Infant Center Main Preschool and Canalino Preschool for all community care licensing documents. I move that we uh, approve the amended resolution number 12-680. Second. Um, uh, resolu uh, this is a roll call. Uh, do you want to discuss it first? Or do we want to discuss it? Just, okay. just so yeah. people know why, mm -hmm. it's because Holly Harvan resigned and oh. she was the designated, was the designated. Mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Alicia? Aye. Andy? Aye. Terry? Aye. And I'm aye. Okay. Uh, move on to item three, resolution 16 783, authorizing signatures. And where is that? It's G. I will move that we approve resolution number 16-783 resolution for authorizing signatures I get a second second roll call Alicia aye Andy aye Harry aye and I'm mine okay move on to major U and the first item is a proposed contract with Berto company to provide message development and public communications regarding major U Contract is for three years um, with a not to exceed amount of $108,000 for the three year period and will be paid with Measure U funds. Yes, and I would like to highly encourage us to continue the relationship. You've seen some of her documents of late. Um, Stephanie has uh, really engaged herself in our district and uh, we have something that's very positive moving along and um, there's an option for us to do it for one year two year three year um, but since we're in it of course we can always cancel if necessary it is cancelable at any time yes if we, if we decide that we absolutely okay. yes so um, 20 to 30 hours a month seems a, like a lot um, it does she turn in time cards? Or? She turns in them directly to me now okay. um, because I meet with her regularly. So part of the 20 to 30 hours is she and I meet, and then we coordinate on all of the Measure U activities given Lena's input and David's input. And then she and I work on the documents, and then we decide on layout and pictures, and I make sure that there's balance of our population and grades and activities and et cetera, et cetera. And then she does attend some of our meetings to take photos and to be there directly to capture um, some of the highlights. Um, but, you know, sometimes like with the newsletter that went out, that will be more than 20 to 30 hours, but then in other times it's less. So everything that happens now for this year, I've um, tightened up many protocols. And so everything like our legal fees and any um, uh, work that's done on any of our contracted services, um, first the person who example works closely with that will verify, then I review everything, affirm, and then I give my signature and it moves over to Maureen to allocate in the appropriate budget fund. So I am more actively engaged in very carefully looking at all of the hours and the work that's being done. Okay. Do we have a motion? <laughs> I feel like it's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. <laughs> Do for through the for the three years well just uh, so what what product is have we been getting currently can you what what's something that certainly that she the has produced the um the annual newsletter that went out mm -hmm. to everyone the articles in the newspaper does that include the website the, cost of the advertisement the advertisement, have? the translation of everything into Spanish. 
So we don't pay for the Coastal View ad. This is part of their yes. scope. Yes. Yes. We do or yes we no, don't. No, we did not <laughs> pay. Okay. We did not pay for the recent. Um, what was it last week or this week? Mm -hmm. The the um, um, press release that went out. Um, it's included in all of that work that she does. Excuse me, what newsletter? There was an annual newsletter that went out. I emailed you, the board. It went to our schools. It was distributed by the schools. Um, you did not receive not it? Not as a parent. I didn't receive it, no. Oh, that's interesting. So I'm just wondering. Mm. Hmm. Did you do Mm -mm. Not as a parent. No. I, I got. Mm -mm. I got a. Not for I me. Got the, I got the draft. Mm -mm. The draft. Mm -hmm. I have a draft. Or the one that you sent to us. Yes. You sent to the board. Mm -hmm. but, yes. But I don't think we got one. My wife didn't get one mm -hmm. as a, as a as a parent. Nope. Hmm. Well, I will look into that. Um, the intention was for that to be distributed through the. It was towards the end of the year, mm -hmm. and um, the principals, um, the goal was for the principals to send it out on their various listservs. It is on our Measure You webpage that she manages. So she manages the webpage? Correct. For us. That's, that's included in? Yes, it is. Yes. Hmm. Just out of curiosity, so um, the contract for one year would be a third of that? 36000 Oh, is it right there? Right oh, I'm here. sorry, I didn't see that. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And it's, and it's just an, est it's an mm -hmm. estimate. And, and she was brought in prior to me or right about the time. I didn't have anything to do with recommending her, but she and I have been working together, and I find uh, that no, her work I, is I, reputable. I, I, don't, I, think, I, I don't think there's any any. Yeah. question about her qualifications or her, <coughs> or her um, you know abilities but I think it's more the cost um, it's a big chunk of money that's a couple of them um, it's an years. yes and it's unfortunate it's, half affordable. Yeah, it it's unfortunate that we don't have staff assigned and someone who can do that um, you know we don't, we don't have anybody at this point in time who can dedicate that time to write the articles, to go out and take the pictures. But it happened before, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. What happened before? Did you have a communications before? thing for the last bond? Well, I'm just thinking of all the stuff going up even to measure you. You know, the things got written in-house. Paul did a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Has she already developed a neighborhood outreach plan or community outreach plan? How much has she built us so far? Just out of curiosity. Of a year? Uh, I'm not prepared to answer that. I can send it to you t for the email. We have it in escape. We can pull up a report um, for the measure U. That's not an issue. Could, could we, um, could we revis maybe revisit this at the yeah, next meeting? We'll yeah. Certainly. Will you let me know specifically what would help you? Um, I would like to know what we've paid her thus far and what has been her deliverables since then. Yeah. And what the timeline is for these other, the rest of the scope will work. No problem. Okay. Yep. Well, we're going to table I that. Agree. Okay. Uh, item two is... Uh, Environmental Consulting Services contract with Dudek uh, Engineering. And we're being asked to approve a proposal from Dudek to provide environmental consulting services on major U projects. And the contract cost will be paid for major U funds. Mm -hmm. uh, each site varies. Mm -hmm. um, but they're going to help with our CEQA yeah. and which apparently, and reading through this, uh, I'm just the the the. It's just crazy how much regulation there mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. and how much money we're going to spend on it. Yeah. Um, Agreed. 
but I think we, I mean, apparently we have to do it. We do. So, okay. We do. So can I get a motion? Uh, I move that we approve the environmental consulting services um, from DUDEC. A second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. <clears throat> uh, pers I, item I personnel. This is an agreement for special services fact finding with School Services of California. Yes, um, well, we are now officially in fact finding. Um, the mediator declared us in fact finding, which means now that we are relying on external uh, support to resolve our differences um, with respect to the negotiations and the um, salary and benefits between the Carpinteria Unified School District and CAUSE. And um, so before you, we have the required um, service agreement for Ron Bennett. I do know this answer to the question, in case you're asking. So far, we have incurred $3,084. Of course, we haven't paid it because he did the work through the mediation process in June, and now we're presented with the official paperwork. So once you approve, we will then in, um, pay the invoice. <laughs> But so far, 3084 And that was just the month of June. So I'll move that we approve the agreement for special services fact-finding with School Services of California. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. OK, board communications. No, just enjoy, uh, we hope that, I hope that staff and students enjoy the rest of the summer. Mine. Right. <laughs> That's a short and simple. Did you enjoy yours? <laughs> yes, so, so far. far. Yes. Yeah. All right. Good. Michelle, nothing. Nope. Huh? Yeah, I don't Good. have anything either. No, I, um, I have had a nice summer so far. It's been pretty it's relaxing. Nice and tan. Yeah. Do you see My that? My hair is long. <laughs> yeah. The, the uh, yeah. yeah, we had some nice camping trips. Hopefully, get one more in before we're done. Okay. Um, okay. I have a couple agenda items. Mm -hmm. All right. So, future agenda items. Um, so CASP scores are coming out yeah, when are officially. They coming? I mean, I know they're out unofficially. But, yeah. Uh, do we have a timeline for releasing those to the public and to us to discuss? <laughs> You're asking for a presentation? Mm -hmm. um, certainly. Just a timeline. Yes. Like September? Or yes. October? We hope to be able to do that um, the late September. One of the other things that we're coming back in um, – Realistically, we had said the end of August or beginning of October is the next phase of the Measure U update from our last workshop. So we will be uh, allocating time for that at the first meeting in September. Um, so yes, we will be bringing back that CASP scores. Okay. Um, and also just proactive, um, probably need the plan for the um, execution of the state preschool contract come January with a spinoff of CCPM mm -hmm. and that subcontract. And, and I'm just kind of bringing that up because um, knowing CDE in that department, they need a lot of lead time on vetting the subcontract. So just heads up on that. <laughs> so, okay, that's it. All right, you wanna add anything? No, I'm fine. We could make this a, like a half a page. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's it. We're going to uh, adjourn to closed session and we'll report back out afterwards.